Oh, hi. Hi, everybody. There they are. Everybody oh, in Today All Day land. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying your Wednesday, and we are so glad you tuned in. It's Today in 30 it, time. It is. Here we go. And it's our special blend of everything you love across all four hours of our show, and we break it down to a single half hour. Yes. First up, new concerns in America's recovery from the pandemic. The nation is going to miss that July 4th vaccination goal set by the White House. And now this Delta variant is spreading fast. We've got everything you need to know about that. Ben, a deeper look at why a record number of Americans are quitting their jobs and that some companies are getting creative to try to bring them back to their desks. And then the one, the only, John Cena tells us about joining the Fast and Furious family for the franchise's ninth installment. Plus, Al's going to introduce us to the newest faces on Sesame Street. Super cool. They've got a great message for kids. Let's get started. Time for Today, Today in 30. Yeah, good morning. So right now we have 150 million Americans who have received at least one shot. So that's 45 percent of the population is now fully vaccinated, fully vaccinated, I should say. And the bottom line here is as we head into the Fourth of July weekend now, just a little more than 10 days away, great concern about that new variant and how that may underline efforts going into the summer and even how that impacts the school starting up in the fall. This morning, the White House is acknowledging a setback, expecting now to fall short of President Biden's goal of vaccinating 70 percent of adults with at least one shot by July 4th, 18 to 26 year olds particularly lagging behind. The reality is many younger Americans have felt like COVID-19 is not something that impacts them and they've been less eager to get the shot. Vaccination efforts are now shifting from high volume centers to local outreach and giveaways to reach hesitant young adults. I don't feel like the vaccine is necessary to me. And also it's not fully FDA approved. So I feel like once we have more information, I think I'll be more open to get it as well. Nationwide, the number of new shots into arms has been trending down recently. So far, nearly two thirds of American adults have received at least one dose. 20 states and D.C. are beating that national rate. But West Virginia, which once led in vaccinations, is now falling to the back of the pack. And four states, Mississippi, Louisiana, Wyoming and Alabama, have yet to hit 50 percent vaccination rates. Those unvaccinated Americans, particularly vulnerable to the highly contagious Delta variant, which now accounts for 20 percent of all new cases, doubling in just one week. The Delta variant is currently the greatest threat in the U.S. to our attempt to eliminate COVID-19. With children under 12 still not eligible for the vaccine, there's growing concern that more kids will catch and spread the mutated virus as states continue to drop COVID restrictions. I think the reality is that kids are becoming more um, likely to be vectors of these new variants. While it's too soon to tell if the Delta variant will be worse for children than other versions of the virus, some parents now worry schools will not be taking the extra precautions in the fall. I see everything reopening and a lot of people sort of acting like it's over and I keep remembering that my kid is under the age of 12 and therefore not yet vaccinated. So for him, it's not over yet. Yeah, importantly here, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer are all running clinical trials to see how well kids under the age of 12 tolerate the vaccine. But that'll take a few more months before those vaccines are available for that age group. Guys, back to you. We're back on our Reopening America series. We're taking a closer look at why millions of workers are calling it quits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stunning new government data shows that a record number of Americans are voluntarily quitting their jobs, leaving many workplaces seriously understaffed. And as NBC's Sam Brock found out, it is forcing some businesses to get creative when it comes to hanging on to employees. Hey, Sam, good morning. Hoda Savannah, Tom, good morning. They are calling this the great resignation, a massive exit of workers from all kinds of industries, from coffee shops to clothing stores, as more generous unemployment benefits, plus the pandemic, fundamentally changing how people view their jobs is prompting some workers to reassess their options. This morning, help wanted is becoming an urgent plea almost everywhere. A growing number of workers are seeking better hours, higher pay, and safer environments, with some hourly wages barely breaking double digits. A 10 or $11 is a joke. Kevin Tamayo is a 26-year-old restaurant server in a new job for six months. He makes just enough to get by, but not enough to afford a car, and says the pandemic changed his perspective. Being inside all day can also, you know, take a toll on you, but 
it, it kind of opened my eyes to the fact that I was being severely exploited and, you know, I was definitely underappreciated. The latest data shows nearly 4 million Americans abandoned their jobs in April. That's the most since the government started tracking the stat 20 years ago. Industry suffering some of the highest losses, leisure and hospitality with more than 740,000 workers, accommodation and food services with more than 680,000, and retail with nearly 650,000. It's likely a combination of factors driving folks to quit, but near the top of the list, a competitive hiring market and fatigue. Our employees were telling us they're burnt out. They can't keep working six, seven days a week. We sat down with them and said, what can we do more? Part of the solution at Sergio's here in Miami, robots, not meant to replace the wait staff, but minimize their exhausting grind. Owner Carlos Gazatua is also offering full benefits, including 401ks, though hiring is still a challenge. We increased rates and in, in pay. Uh, we have 401ks. We have health care plans. But yet, people were just not applying um, to the point where volume started to pick up, but we still had the same labor force. Big retailers like Amazon, Costco, and Target are trying to lure workers with $15 wages to start. Office workers get some perks, too. The popular dating app Bumble closing its offices this entire week to give its staff a break. While the crowdfunding platform Kickstarter says it's gearing up to test a four-day work week sometime next year. So I don't see it as a binary. You know, you can either have productivity or you can have wellness. The concept is how do you set those things in motion with each other? in a way that actually brings more value in all parts of your life. Do you feel like workers at Kickstarter are burned out right now? You know, I think that everybody around the world, doesn't matter uh, how you're working, where you're working, um, whether that's, you know, at home, whether that's uh, in an office, are, are feeling it. Stick around because there's much more coming up on Today in 30. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. All right, welcome back. The Fast and the Furious franchise is getting even faster and more furious because <laughs> John Cena, he's joined the fold for F9. He's furious, sir. And if you think the action was out of this world in the first eight movies, well, ho, 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 ho. wait till you see this one. John, good morning. Good morning, John. Out of this world, fantastic choice. Yes. Uh, hold on. I must say that was an awesome uh, piece on the oh, group to me charity, and I really there was a quote in there that spoke to me. I just care that the girls feel good about themselves, so they make good choices. I thought that was an excellent piece, oh, so thank you very much. It was. Thank you, John. Yeah, I love it. She says, "I don't care if they become dancers. I yes. just want them to be good choices yes. in their lives." All right, well, John, you've made a choice uh -huh. to be in Fast and Furious <laughs> Nine. How was that for a segue? And I, apparently, I heard this story that you kind of found out in an unusual way. Can you tell us? Yeah, so I was in L.A. on business, and I was contacted that Vin Diesel would like to talk to me. And, uh, <laughs> of course, I wanted to go have a conversation with uh, Dom Toretto, and I kind of went to his training center, uh, which is like the Dom Shrine. And so you can see the old chargers in the back, and we had a long conversation. And at the end, he shoots this social video, and at the end, he kind of puts the camera on me. And I'm like a deer in headlights because I don't know what's going on. So I just 
<laughs> really don't even know. Because <laughs> no one was ever explained of like, hey, we're considering you for fast. We just talked for a few hours about everything. And I left being like, wow, I just hung out with Vin Diesel. That was pretty cool. And then later on, I got the invite to join the Fast family. And I later found out that I would be a Toretto. That is so cool. First, you play a bad guy, and that shocked me because I, I don't see you in that bad guy role. So how was that? That's the fun of performing, to be able to, to harness different sides of you and be able to showcase a uh, different skill set. And this is what a, what a stage. And the, the Fast and Furious mythology is so grand and reaches so many people. It just really was a, a, just a special thing to be a part of. Now, are you a good driver? <laughs> so that's a question that's like a psychological profile question. Yeah. I would say that's what I'm getting at. Better than anybody else. I <laughs> tend to drive fast and not too furious. Okay. Oh, you're a fast, careful driver. Fast right. and zen, though, doesn't have the so, same ring. So wait, John, this, these guys have been together forever. You're the newbie. You came in. I'm sure there was some kind of initiation. Like, what did they do to you when you joined the team? So, no initiation, but it really is like, bringing someone to a family dinner like everybody's eyeing you up and everyone is like questioning your intentions which i actually like and to put it into perspective you know people have given 20 years of their lives to this legacy and they really just want to do it justice and make sure fans around the world are entertained and when everybody goes to cf9 in theaters on friday they want to make sure it 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 delivers and uh i i really like the fact that everyone kind of was standoffish at first mm -hmm. and kind of make, made sure i was uh, my intentions were pure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is not some uh, small indie production it's yeah. huge you know there have been eight other of these films this is going to be opening in the theaters mm -hmm. have you been surprised at just like how big a franchise mm -hmm. this is this is simply the largest thing I've ever been a part of. And yesterday, Fast, the, the saga celebrated its 20th anniversary. Wow. So they've been making these movies for two decades, and it's only fitting that, you know, this close to the 20th anniversary is the newest installment in theaters on Friday. And I really think, given the, the circumstances of the world, and now we're all eager to be entertained with cinema again, obviously safely, but what a, what a, I couldn't think of a better film than F9 to bring audiences back to that Hollywood blockbuster feel that they've been craving for so long. Well, you know, I was wondering, every time I see you, I always, uh, people associate you usually with, with the WWE, and I just wondered if on some days you just miss it. Do you ever think to yourself, boy, you know, I wish I could get back in the ring. I sit every day, just like I miss sitting sitting with, with you guys, talking mm -hmm. about the news and having great conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I really miss it. There's... There's nothing like it. Uh, I will be back. I, I'm not sure when I'll be back because uh, I'm really fortunate to have some great opportunities now that I'd like to pursue. But uh, yeah, I, I miss it every single day and I can't wait to put on some jean shorts and take my shirt off. And we, know, we know how you like to do. <laughs> yes, exactly. John, thank you. Maybe for Fast and Furious 10, you could do yeah. that too. It's from our uh, sister company, Universal <laughs> Pictures, and it opens in theaters and only in theaters, I believe, yes. on Friday. Cool. Hey. Go oh, to the theater with CF9 on Friday. Cool. You got it. Thank, Thank you, John. John. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. nice. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> Hey now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. <laughs> Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, that's just shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. 
they are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For generations, Sesame Street has taught kids so many important lessons, and now they're tackling a new one. And they always do it in such a good way. So the importance of celebrating differences and teaching our, our youngsters about race and racism. That's right. Well, this time they're doing it through the eyes of two new friends who I got the chance to meet. Hi, my name is Wes. Hey, everybody. I'm Elijah Walker. Hi, Elmo's name is Elmo. <laughs> there are two new neighbors in the neighborhood. It is so great to meet you, Wes and Elijah. And, and, and Elmo, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too, Mr. Welcome. Right. While Sesame has always celebrated differences and diversity, a father and son tackle a tough issue, race. Why was it important to, to address race and differences now? After what happened last summer, we knew that we needed to be more explicit about talking about race because children and families needed it. With Sesame's Coming Together initiative, creating the ABCs of racial literacy, seeing the issue as Sesame always does through the eyes of a young child. Five-year-old Wes and his meteorologist dad Elijah's experiences, but starting with the basics. Elmo wants to know why Wes's skin is brown. Oh, I know why, Elmo. My mom and dad told me. It's because of melanin. Right, Dad? That's right. Melanin? Uh, uh, what's that? Well, Melanin is something that we each have inside our bodies that make the outside of our bodies the skin color that it is. It also gives us our eye and our hair color. Experts say children begin to notice the differences in race in infancy and start forming their own sense of identity at a very young age. So Sesame decided to tackle race and racism head on. One of the great things about Sesame Street is that people accept people for who they are. But, but Wes, you know, there have been times where people have done things or, or said things that yeah. didn't make you feel good. There was, there was one time um, at my old school when I wanted to be the pretend guitarist, but they said that I couldn't be the pretend guitarist because of the way that I look, because people who look like me should be rappers because they rap the best. And that wasn't very nice. It, it, it made me feel really bad. But then, but then I talked to my dad and he told me that I could be whatever I wanted to be. A study commissioned by Sesame Workshop of parents with kids ages 6 to 11 reported that 42% had personally experienced discrimination. Nearly two-thirds of those with black children reporting racist incidents. So to help, Sesame created videos like Breathe, Feel, hey, Share to help kids oh, have honey, open conversations honey, about honey. race Someone and racism. Breathe. Uh, to calm down. Uh, feel notice how I'm feeling and say it, and then share. Tell a grown-up what happened. <laughs> For the grown-ups watching, a guide to help with those tough conversations. Elijah, I've had to have difficult talks with my kids, but it's particularly tough when you've got to talk to a, a, a four or five-year-old about race. How, how difficult is that? Yeah, we talk about being proud of things. We talk about things that make us unique, and we talk about some of the difficulties that can come. Were you surprised that after all this time, you still have to have those conversations? I'm not surprised. I'm disappointed sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it, it, things do seem like they're getting better, but we want to make sure that we equip our kids with the tools that they need to talk mm -hmm. about and, and to exist in this world. Teaching these lessons through Sesame characters allows for a directness, a lack of nuance that young kids are looking for. It was important for us to make sure that people understood not only what was right, which is what we were modeling, but also what was wrong. And so this initiative is trying to really represent that for children and to use language that families and children feel comfortable with. And since Elijah and I share a fondness for forecasts, the weather report seems somewhat similar across the country. Uh, Ernie's Grove, Washington, 88 degrees. A perfect weather to float your rubber ducky. <laughs> That's right. Grover Beach, California, 88 degrees. And that's just super. Uh, Bird City, Kansas, 88 degrees. Oh, man, I'd like to get out to the park and feed the pigeons. 88 <laughs> degrees in Oscar, Minnesota. Well, hopefully it'll get some rain. I know Oscar would love that. Had a great time uh, talking with Elijah 
and Wes from Sesame Street. They were so special and really nice. And got to see our old buddy Elmo. So always good to see Elmo. Who doesn't love them some Elmo? Dylan and, and Chanel love Elmo, don't they? Oh, they're completely ignoring me. This is just the way it is here on our street. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Our Across America journey here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Hey guys, um, I had the privilege of sitting down with Bobby Thomas to interview her after the passing of her husband, Michael, and I had not seen Bobby until that moment. And you know, sometimes you wonder, like, if you should reach out to a friend, um, and if you should call, and Bobby gave the answer, and that is every single time. If you have the urge to speak to someone, reach out. Because what we don't realize is a lot of times people are sitting by themselves. And Bobby and I have had the opportunity to speak over this time period. But um, she gave great advice. If you have a friend in despair, pick up the phone right away. Don't think, maybe they don't need me, maybe they don't want me. Um, anyway, it's a wrap around here. We love Bobby Thomas. As we say around here often, we are a family. Mm -hmm. We celebrate each other's happiness and we mourn each other's losses. Yeah, we sure do. And uh, throughout the 15 years that she's been with our show, there's been a lot to celebrate for our dear friend and today's style editor, Bobby Thomas. But over the last six months, we've mourned with her since the untimely passing of her beloved husband, Michael Marion. Uh, before they were married, Michael was diagnosed with an immune deficiency. And while Bobby realized Michael may not live to 90, she never imagined that he'd pass away at just 44 years old. I sat down with Bobby and she shared her journey and it's one of loss and grief, but also of resilience and gratitude. I wake up trying to find some t-shirts that still smell like Michael. <laughs> Which ones weren't washed, you know? I've never been more in love with him. <laughs> really? More in love now. Their love story began in 2008 when Bobby first met Michael. She was fiercely independent. The idea of marriage had scared me mm -hmm. so much. I mean, even when he proposed to me, mm -hmm. I mean, he would be screaming right now. He, <laughs> I said, yes, but can I have 30 days? And I remember thinking, is he gonna like take it back? But instead he said, okay. And then two days later he woke up and he was like, 28 more days to go. And that was him. He just was so um, positive and optimistic. He carried that through the hardest challenges that no one should have to go through. The kind of challenges traditional wedding vows include for better or for worse. With this ring, I be wed. I be wed. Shortly after their fairy tale wedding in 2013, Bobby and Michael publicly shared their very personal journey to parenthood. It takes a village to raise children, but to make them too. We celebrated alongside them when they revealed they were expecting. Can we say that again? Bobby is pregnant. He is pregnant. Thank God. Yes. Thank God. And when they welcomed little Miles into the world. But four years later in 2019, hardship would follow. I remember how 
jarring it was for us to learn that Michael, when he was just 40 years old, he's on a business trip and suddenly he collapses and you later learn that he had a stroke. My heart dropped out. I mean, you become one person and it felt so unfair. Doctors told Bobby a full recovery was uncertain, but even in the face of adversity, Michael never lost his determination. That's it. That's better. Michael recovered, and it's so important that we focus on recovery. He went from not walking, mm -hmm. not talking, mm -hmm. to learning to talk again, getting out of his wheelchair, and actually walking. And it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really unbelievable to even the doctors that he continued to overcome mm -hmm. and was about to return to work. But in the fall of 2020, unrelated to the stroke, Michael developed a bacterial infection. It was five weeks in the ICU, and it was just one thing after the other, like a domino effect. Mm -hmm. So when things just increasingly became problematic, it seemed as if we were up against the impossible. It was multiple organ failure. And besides the very worst memory of my whole life of seeing his last one, oh. was having to look at his parents and his mom. Mm -hmm. I will never, ever be able to love anyone more deeply. Mm -hmm. And I will do anything for them and his family and his sister. But his parents are the strongest and in the face of losing their son, they were there trying to console me. Now, Bobby is trying to console others and help them navigate the very same path she's still figuring out herself. It's important to say out loud for myself and for others that you have to give yourself the grace to not try and fix it, <laughs> the pain, because so often, we are in a position where, you know, pain is uncomfortable. The pain is so precious to me. It's my connection to him. And it's like, I don't want the hurt to go away because it gets further away. And that sounds crazy to say out loud, but I'm starting to embrace that. And I, if I can do anything to tell other people who are going through this, because I know how alone I feel and I have so much support, it's to, not feel like the problem. The pain that, you, that you're feeling, that you're going through, the loss is fresh. It was December. See, and in my mind, yeah. I have this clock ticking and I think, oh my gosh, it's six months. You know, you should be, you should be better. You should be fixed. And I, I really appreciate as humans that we want to do that, but it is really hard to learn how to carry something. What struck me is not only are people trying to fix your pain, your son's trying to fix your pain. Mm. He's trying to heal you. That's the most painful because I'm his mom. <laughs> and he is at five looking for solutions. Mm. One night at bedtime, mm -hmm. he asked me who invented it and why. And I thought he was going to ask me about a truck or yeah. something. Yeah. And he said, this life, I was stunned. Yeah. And he's like, I just don't understand why we all can't be angels. And he was still trying to figure out how we could all be together. These days, Bobby is holding on to Miles even tighter, focusing not on what she's lost, but on the gifts Michael has given her. Oh my gosh! For as long as I've known you, you've spoken about gratitude. Can you still find gratitude? It's now? my compass. Like, a lot of people want to say, oh, but it was so hard. Yeah. He was so sick. And the thing that I don't know how to communicate really in that moment usually is, it was such a tragic gift in a way because you did not have time to be bored or worry about what you didn't have. When Michael and I were going through some of the hardest times, it was so simple. <laughs> it was really basic. And sometimes that simplicity was magic. You woke up, you worried about what mattered, and you were so grateful for what you had. We were together, and we had hope. And it's something that will never leave. 
Another big show tomorrow. Who's big, on? big Who's show. On? Amy Poehler <gasps> and Nick her. Offerman. Love. Both here. Two for the price of one. All right. We're going to see you tomorrow, Thursday. Bye. Have a good one. Welcome to Today All Day. I am so excited to share some of my favorite stories with you. I've interviewed so many empowering change makers, amazing moms, and even a few of my own family members through the years. I hope you enjoy these stories as much as I do and learn a little something along the way. Padma has had such a long career. What has been your favorite moment or proudest accomplishment uh, for you as her mom? I went to Rome when she was doing a TV serial. And the same stress came, and she, in her broken English Italian, explained, Padma is the only person who comes to speak to same stress with respect. No matter how much she earns, the idea she could respect those people are the biggest thing. Hi, everybody. I am so excited for you to hear my next conversation with my new favorite mom. Let's face it, motherhood certainly isn't easy, especially when you're a single mom and you've immigrated here with a daughter all by yourself. Well, today, that daughter is a cookbook author, Emmy award-winning TV host, activist model, and TV food lover. I'm talking about the one and only Padma Lakshmi, and I am so excited to chat with the woman who raised her, Vijaya. Tell me, what was Padma like as a child? When Padma was young, she was very imaginative. So the teachers asked me, are you French? I said, no, we are from India. No, your daughter told me. So I asked her, why would you say we are French? She says, mom, half the people, they don't know where is India. Next, they, they don't understand if I said to them, I speak Tamil, but if I say I speak French, I didn't want to make them confused. Take me back to when you made the decision to leave India and to come to the United States. Tell me as a mom what that was like to leave for a little bit to try to get something established here in the States. It was very hard because till then I was never separated. Padma was brought up from two to four with my parents. After 14 months, I came back to India once and saw her. She asked me, Mom, when are you going to come and take me to America? My eyes started tearing. I said, pretty soon, my darling, I am working on it. You sacrificed so much to try to give her a foundation. Do you remember when she first got here, what it was like to be reunited again? Yes. Ran down and I picked her up. And that was the joyous day in my life. Even if I don't achieve anything else that day, I thank God for being graceful to me. And tell me, when did you guys start to cook together? We cooked when she was very young, but I think more, uh, she had some Filipino friends in New York, and she saw them cooking, and one day she said, Mom, I can cook. So I was surprised. I said, what can we cook? She said, I can cook soup, and she put the can on the stove. So I thought that you don't do that. She put the actual can on the stove? Yes. So I had to teach her. How did you balance working as a nurse, raising a young child on your own? How did you do it all? How did you juggle? Well, I think when you have to do, there is nothing you can't do. And she used to tell me, Mom, one day I become a movie star. That's what she said. I, you don't have to buy anything. I'll buy it. In her memoir, she talked about how she struggled with self-confidence sometime. 
as a kid and she had to come to terms with her identity. Uh, I heard an interview where she said sometimes they referred to her as, you know, a black giraffe because she was tall or sometimes she would have one foot in this world and another foot in that world. How did you deal with that when you see your daughter struggling with her identity? I had to make her sit and talk, although God is great, but he had to make different colors. I said, don't let that bother. But of course it bothered her. And telling the truth, we are different, but we are same because we are all human beings. We feel anger, we feel love in the same way. She's talked very open about the fact that and you know, she was in a pretty serious car accident when she was 14 years old, um, and she has that scar on her arm. What do you think gave her the strength to deal with some of those hardships and how she was able to overcome them and triumph in the end, really? Initially, she had to go to school, so she would wear long sleeves slowly. She got used to it, and a photographer said, no, that's a beautiful star. And from that time, she opened it. See, I couldn't be that free. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. I joined Ellen on her set. What's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, of violence and persecution in their home countries. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. If you think about the, the journey that you guys have had, the times when you were here in the States by yourself, bringing her over, Fast forward to now, what's it like watching her on television and to see so many people adore her? What is that like for you as a mom? Sometimes I don't even believe her. Is it my daughter? Sometimes I think, I don't know how she gets up so early in the morning. How do you get it so crispy? What's the secret? The secret is exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> but is it, is it... I'm very proud of her. Tell me, do you have all of the cookbooks that she's created and do you watch her on television? She usually cooks at least one meal in her house, even if I go there. And the difference between us is that she is very methodical. She won't mix things, whereas I mix things. So when she cooks, I just observe and say, what do you want me to do? Is there something that she cooks that's your favorite? I like her cooking the full chicken with vegetable, baking it. She has equally spent time knowing Indian food, and I am happy for her to be Indian American than just Indian or just American. When did you know that she was successful? When she was cooking, modeling, like when did you exhale and say, you know what, I think my sacrifice has paid off and, and Padma's gonna be okay? That's a difficult question to say, but I think her activist areas where she has worked for women and color, LGBT, all those things, matter to me because 
they are the ones who need help. She's very vocal about immigration and women's rights. Has she always been passionate about using her voice for change? Yes. So I'm glad she's like a woman I wanted to be, but I didn't have guts to be. I lived in the era, even though I was here, what we would say. I respect that she has a guts to fight for women, fight for weaker people. If I were to ask you, what is the one thing you did right as a mom? What did you do right? I brought her up, not as a strict mother, a mother to whom she can come and say, I goofed, this is what happened. How can we fix this? My last question, what's your biggest piece of advice to other parents? Relax, enjoy the parenthood, get down with them and play, because a lot of times we are busy doing our chores. You were wonderful. <laughs> That's it. You were so, so wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. you are a good mother, Chanel. Oh, thank you. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Make the most of your day with... Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends at Today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Ready actors. An indie horror film. A talented young actress. And a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hardest decision you've had to make as a mom. Ooh. You know, I think sometimes, especially as they're adults, is telling them the truth. But as your kids get older, sometimes they don't really want to hear sometimes what mom has to say, but you feel it so hard and so strong in your gut that it's like, I got to tell you what I have to say. I, I would say that's the hardest thing. Our next mother has two beautiful daughters who have been in the entertainment industry for a very long time. We're talking about Jessica and Ashley Simpson. They are singers, reality show stars, actresses, authors, businesswomen, and much more. But today, I get to chat with the woman they call their number one fan and role model, their mom, Tina. Let's start at the very beginning. Tell me about those early years in Texas with the girls, and you were a young mom. I got married at 18, had Jessica at 20, and Ashley at 24. I was definitely a very young mother, but it was like only thing I ever wanted to do. I mean, I really did. It was just like my passion. But in the younger years, I mean, it was hard. My ex, Joe, their dad, was a youth pastor, and we were very poor. We didn't have much money, and we moved around a lot because we'd go from church to church and, um, you know, help kids. When it came to groceries or cooking dinner, like how did you how did you do it day to day? 
Honestly, we both had a lot of jobs. I would have like aerobic classes in the church and taught, like created these little classes that Jessica always calls it Jump for Jesus. But the name of it really <laughs> was called Heavenly Bodies. <laughs> And it was this, like Christian aerobic class that I taught, you know, so we were always like, you know, kind of had like our little side jobs, we were making money, uh, you know, making ends meet. And it was never like, oh my gosh, we don't have anything. I mean, we always felt like we had all we needed. The cool thing is they had each other. Like, do you remember the dynamics back then? You know, Jessica was four when Ashley was born and literally she was like her second mother. And as soon as Ashley was old enough and she just started sleeping with Jessica. And so they slept together every night for the rest of their lives pretty much until they got married. <laughs> Are they different? How would you describe their personalities even growing up? Ashley was a little more rebellious, whereas Jessica was a little bit more like pleasing, whereas Ashley would be like, mm, let me show you what I can do. When you look back at those early years, what did you do right, Tina? I just love them and, you know, I was a disciplinarian, not harsh or anything like that, but, you know, they knew they could push me so far and then they couldn't push me any further, but we laughed a lot. We had a lot of laughter, a lot of fun, just found a lot of joy in life, you know, in the midst of whatever was coming, it was like, you know, we'll be able to face this together. So when did the singing start taking hold? Tell me about what age were they when you said, ooh, we've got something here. Well, for Jessica, like, it was very young because she was like three years old. She'd be singing in the back of the car. It's like when she put a mic in her hand, like she came alive and it was just her passion. I could just see it in her. And it was the same with Ashley. That kid came out of my womb dancing. And so she would dance and perform and that was her favorite thing to do, you know, and entertain everybody that came over. And my advice to any parent always is to say, just watch your kids because your kids are going to tell you what their passion is. I love that. There are so many people watching, I'm sure, or parents watching who will say, okay, where is the line between you have this kid who's really talented, they can sing, they can dance. Like, how did you break into the, I don't want to say break into stardom, but when did the break happen? Yeah, well, that happened actually not really until um, Jessica went to the Mickey Mouse Club auditions. And that was a random fluke. You know, we were just like, We'd been in, not been in the business at all. And um, like I said, just singing in church. And Jessica auditioned and they flew us to Orlando for two weeks to Disney World uh, to go to Disney camp. And that was uh, like Ryan Gosling and Justin Timberlake and Christina Aguilera. These are the people that were in the camp with Jessica. Was it surreal? It was, we were very innocent and honestly in starting it very naive. But because of that, I was not letting those kids out of my clutches. I was gonna be the mother that stayed with my kids in that industry and watch over them and make sure that they were never alone. How did you deal with it as, as a mom mentally? You know, it was really hard because they were judged by the world, obviously. And that was probably the most stressful thing is like just the, the negativity of like things that people would say. I really taught them to just be fighters. We're very spiritual people and lean deep into that and teaching them like, you know, the world is not always easy, but uh, people are gonna say negative things about us, but you know, you rise above that by loving others and, and sharing that love and just letting your heart pour out. Is this chicken what I have or is this fish? Baby, I messed up. I'm not good at this whole housewife thing yet. Reality shows sometimes, there can be a narrative, and once it takes hold, sometimes you even watch a show and you're like, wait, huh? You know, and you're almost kind of swept on to, under this, into this current. What was it like for you as a mom? The reality television show was, uh, you know, it was, it was hard in some ways because I'm more private. So that part was a little bit of a struggle for me at first. So it'd be like, oh, wow, do we really want to do this? You know, and making sure that we were, again, really protecting the narrative. And back then it was, I mean, it was the real deal. It wasn't scripted. You know, it was, was invasive, to be honest. But soon you kind of learn that they're not there in a way. And you just kind of let your life flow and let it go. Jessica herself and Ashley both are so naturally funny. like. The things that would just come out of Jessica's mouth, it, I mean, that's just really real. There are times where Jessica has been very open and healing, I will say, when she's talked about weight shaming. How do you, as a mom, how do you deal with that? I mean, 
when your every move is is being talked about and especially for weight that's a challenging one because we're all dealing with it i have to be honest to me the hardest thing with jessica has been the weight because the way people judge her it's unbelievable body shaming is a terrible thing and no girl should have to go through that our guy period no one because of that it catapulted all kinds of different emotions and different things in her life too you know and then it made her want to be a recluse in a lot of ways and you know to hide out and not want to get out of her house or you know things like that that it just like wasn't who she was Many celebrities launch clothing lines, but few are as successful as Jessica Simpson. Okay, I found a very comfortable, affordable shoe. Here it is. It's so cute. Look at it. Look at it. it. It's Jessica Simpson. So I remember sitting in church, and I look over, and I was like, ooh, Grandma, where did you get those black pumps, those heels? And she said, honey, Jessica Simpson. <laughs> I love it. And I was like, really? She has shoes, and she was like, oh, girl, yeah, the, the best shoes. It's just funny to me because you guys have had, like, nine lives. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, we truly have. The whole collection is just, I think people underestimate how successful it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have 36 uh, licensed categories of uh, product now with the Jessica Simpson collection. Yeah, and that's, you know, and it's funny because that all came from like, we were doing the reality show and they would call us and they'd be like, oh my gosh, like every time Jessica wears this, it sells out. So I looked at Jessica one day and I said, you know what? Well, I mean, this is great that you're selling out all this product for Juicy and we love these girls and they're amazing. I said, but what about if like we did our own line? Like, what do you think about that? And she looks at me, she goes, Mom, I think that's great. I think that's amazing. I'm sitting here thinking, I mean, from like making costumes on stage to running a frankly billion dollar company. I mean, it's it's something out of, it's like something out of a movie. <laughs> you wouldn't even believe it, you it, know? It's true. It's really true. Favorite moment of this wild ride you have had with your daughters? Oh man, there's so many. Like my head's like spinning. When you see them take a stage and they like own that stage, and like all their beautiful gifts come shining through and they enlighten people and they give them hope and they show them that, you know, that they can do this too. I, I, those are my, my most favorite moments. Last question, what is the biggest advice you have for other moms? Just love them, meet them where they are, love them where they're at, encourage them and, you know, be their rock, just be that rock. Be, Take anything, like don't let anything totally shock you. <laughs> you know, like let them just pour their heart out to you about whatever, be an open book, <laughs> to use that term, to your children, you know, just really like lay it out there so they know that they have you and that you're not going anywhere. Oh my gosh, if we were in person, I'd give you a hug. I wish we could hug me. Thank you so much. That was so, so beautiful, Tina. You're such a beautiful mom. Like it's just, Aww. it's, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. That's just Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Call your mother. Call your mother. Yes, call, call your mother. No big deal. Just, hi, Ma, how are you? I love you. I got a call.
I don't need a discussion. You don't need to be telling me all kinds. Of, that's all I'm asking. Do they all still call home? Even now? As grown men, grown women, they still call? Yes. Matt calls me from all over the world. Every single day for the past two and a half years. I don't care if it's three o'clock in the morning, whatever it is. You're going to love my new favorite mom. Even though I say everybody's my favorite, it's because I love them all. Today, you know her last name, Wahlberg. It's famous. She has nine kids. But we get to chat with the woman behind the last name. Hi. Hi. Oh, yeah, beautiful. Oh, thank you. I know I can only imagine all the stories you have about chasing them down the streets, but at the end of the day, when you hear them talk, they're kind, they're gracious, they're humble. Mm -hmm. How did you do it? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I mean, there were times that I really hit bottom and said, I can't do this. When was it the hardest? When they were small, and they were all small. That's when I used to have to go get the welfare butter and cheese. Were you cooking every day? That was a challenge. How did you do it? I'm not quite sure. I swear to God, I invented the craziest meals. Like what? Oh, English muffin pizzas. That was the big treat. Did you ever run out of ideas? Not really, I had no choice. I had to find them something to eat. If I were to ask you, Alma, the two things you did right, what would you say? At the time, I didn't know I was doing right. You know what I mean? I was just doing what I felt like I had to do. Did you have to be tough? At times, yes, yeah. The other thing was, I always try to mean what I said. I didn't know what was the right or wrong thing sometimes, because sometimes it got really crazy, because <laughs> there's nine of them all doing different things. As they were getting older, I noticed they were being nicer to each other. Give me some advice for parents who have kids who they see talent in, whether it's acting or singing. Talk about like Donnie, for example, or Mark, since they're known as the performers. Encourage them immediately. Did you? Yes, I did. How early did you see the talent? The first time I went to, it was a neighborhood show in one of the schools, and the new kids were gonna perform. I was like, whoa. Oh my God, they're good. <laughs> What's that like? Because I don't know what that's like. People are cheering, screaming. Mm -hmm. What does that feel like for you? Oh, uh, I don't know if I could explain it, but I'll show you one thing. Okay. This was a New Kids concert. And my son came down off the stage and sung to me and was hugging me. I just, oh my God, what a feeling. Is um, it pride? Is it love? Is it's it... both. It's both. Especially knowing the journey. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But he said to me, you know, Ma, if it wasn't for you, there probably wouldn't have been any new kids because you encouraged us. You were pushing us. And I was. How'd you push them? Just practicing? Or? Yeah, I said, you gotta rehearse. Favorite family tradition? I think that would be probably Thanksgiving. Because no matter where anybody is, we all get together and we enjoy it. We have a lot of, a lot of fun. Any nicknames of the kids growing up? Okay, I'm gonna get in trouble now. <laughs> Donnie was baby Donnie. Mac was monkey. What? Because I bought him a monkey for Christmas. He loved that thing so much. And he dragged it with him everywhere. What advice would you give to your younger self as a mom? I was learning as they were learning. And I told him, I said, all I am asking from you, just want you to be a good person. I wanted to give them the love that I always felt I wanted and never got. And I wanted them to know I'm always there, always, always. I may not like what you're telling me, <laughs> but I'm there for you. And that's it. And that's how they all are now. They're there for me. Hi, Mom. I love you. Every single time that I ever needed you, despite how many crazy kids are in that house and animals and in-laws and you name it, um, you always found me and took care of me and made me feel better even in the darkest of times. And I love you and I thank you and I'm proud of you. 
Thank you, baby. That is everything. Here, show me this. This is the family. This is the unit. You know, I hear the word matriarch, mm -hmm. and I don't use it a lot. Yeah. But you're a matriarch. I mean, look at this. You're right at the center. And you're tiny. And it's all here. Yeah. It's amazing. And now I look at them, and every single one of them are good people. And they help people, and be proud of. Definitely. Thank you. Hi, Today All Day. We've got a great show for you on this Wednesday morning, including an all-day exclusive chat you can only see here. But let's kick it off with Pop Start. Saturday Night Live had a historic 46th season, getting 20 episodes on the air with COVID safety protocols and Peacock was there to capture it all. We have the exclusive first look at Peacock's stories from the show, a look back at SNL season 46. Check it out. Best time. Okay, oh, let's go, Chanel. Oh, we have some good yes. stuff for you this Do morning. You. Hey. Pop star. We, gonna, right, we, we will start with Saturday Night Live after a historic 46 season where the cast and crew worked through COVID safety protocols to get all 20 episodes on the air. They're taking a step back to appreciate the season that was. We have an exclusive first look at the Peacock special. It's called Stories from the Show, a look back at SNL season 46. In it, the cast, crew, and Lauren Michaels share what it was like getting this unusual season of television on the air. Here's a peek. What's going on? Hi. Hey. Well, you start. You're the smart one. <laughs> Let me go. Okay. Okay? You go. Okay. Um, this season... This is what this season is going <laughs> I would say in a normal week of making the show, it's normal to cry <laughs> once or twice. <laughs> and in a pandemic version of making the show, you might cry every day. <laughs> and that's comedy. <laughs> Uh, that's see this. You can see stream stories from the show for free oh. starting tomorrow on Peacock. They have a lot to give. Mm -hmm. Next up, our very own Craig Melvin. Craig's out today on assignment, but last night he stopped by the Late Show with Stephen Colbert to talk about his new book, Pops. And during their conversation, listen to this, Craig revealed he credits his career to a chat he had with Steven years ago on a flight to New York to interview at NBC News. Here's why Craig says that chance encounter changed his life. You talked about how when you got the call to go to The Daily Show, how up until that point you were writing for some sitcoms and you weren't killing it. And then you became Stephen Colbert. And I remember in that moment thinking, if this guy can do it, <laughs> if this guy can make it, and you're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Seriously, you're welcome. It was it was it was the pep talk that the kid from Columbia, South Carolina, desperately needed. How great is that? Sweet. Yeah. Go back and watch the whole interview. Yeah. It is spectacular. Craig knocked it out of the park. Really oh. Craig kills it. He did. Uh, he did. And, and Colbert, they, they were, look, two guys from South Carolina. I know. Yeah, that. That. Yeah. They got a real bond. So there you go. We can All thank right. Stephen Colbert for Craig. Finally, Rachel Zegler, the star of Steven Spielberg's upcoming West Side Story remake, just landed another iconic role. Zegler is set to play Snow White oh. in Disney's live-action reimagining of the 1937 animated film. Huge news for someone who hasn't yet to make her official big screen debut. Prior to being cast as Maria in West Side Story, Ziegler had never acted professionally before. She just had this beautiful voice. She was 17 years old from New Jersey, beat out more than 30,000 wow. other actresses for this role. And you may remember, this was a sweet moment back in April when she recorded herself seeing the trailer mm -hmm. for the first time. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> So <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I'm in a movie! <laughs> That's pretty cool. Production for Snow White is set to start next year. We're rooting for her, and Spielberg's West Side Story hits theaters in December. So. You're in two movies! Oh I know, I know. Awesome. It's good to feel someone else's joy. Yeah. Yes, know. it is. Coming up on Today Talks, we meet the newest Muppets on Sesame Street. 
and one of them has something in common with Dylan and Al. Stay with us to find out. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Our Across America journey here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Welcome back. Today on the third hour, Al takes a trip to Sesame Street and meets the two newest neighbors. Take a look. Hi, my name is Wes. Hey, everybody. I'm Elijah Walker. Hi, I'm a name is Elmo. <laughs> there are two new neighbors in the neighborhood. It is so great to meet you, Wes and Elijah. And, <laughs> and, and Elmo, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too, Mr. Walker. While Sesame has always celebrated differences and diversity, a father and son tackle a tough issue, race. Why was it important to, to address race and differences now? After what happened last summer, we knew that we needed to be more explicit about talking about race because children and families needed it. With Sesame's Coming Together initiative, creating the ABCs of racial literacy, seeing the issue as Sesame always does through the eyes of a young child. Five-year-old Wes and his meteorologist dad Elijah's experiences, but starting with the basics. Elmo wants to know why Wes's skin is brown. Oh, I know why, Elmo. My mom and dad told me. It's because of melanin. Right, Dad? That's right. Melanin? Uh, uh, what's that? Well, melanin is something that we each have inside our bodies that make the outside of our bodies the skin color that it is. It also gives us our eye and our hair color. Experts say children begin to notice the differences in race in infancy and start forming their own sense of identity at a very young age. So Sesame decided to tackle race and racism head on. One of the great things about Sesame Street is that people accept people for who they are. But, but Wes, there have been times where people have done things or, or said things that didn't make you feel good. There was, there was one time um, at my old school when I wanted to be the pretend guitarist, but they said that I couldn't be the pretend guitarist because of the way that I look, because people who look like me should be rappers because they rap the best. And that wasn't very nice. It, it, it made me feel really bad. But then, but then I talked to my dad and he told me that I could be whatever I wanted to be. A study commissioned by Sesame Workshop of parents with kids ages 6 to 11 reported that 42% had personally experienced discrimination. Nearly two-thirds of those with black children reporting racist incidents. So to help, Sesame created videos like Breathe, Feel, hey, Share to help Come kids on. have Honey, open conversations awkward. about race Somebody and racism. Breathe. Uh, to calm down. Uh, feel notice how I'm feeling and say it, and then share. Tell a grown-up what happened. <laughs> For the grown-ups watching, a guide to help with those tough conversations. Elijah, I I've had to have difficult talks with my kids, but it's particularly tough when you've got to talk to a, a, a four or five-year-old about race. How, how difficult is that? Yeah, we talk about being proud of things. We talk about things that make us unique, and we talk about some of the difficulties that can come. Were you surprised that after all this time, you still have to have those conversations? I'm not surprised. I'm disappointed sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
but it, it, things do seem like they're getting better, but we want to make sure that we equip our kids with the tools that they need to talk about and, and to exist in this world. Teaching these lessons through Sesame characters allows for a directness, a lack of nuance that young kids are looking for. It was important for us to make sure that people understood not only what was right, which is what we were modeling, but also what was wrong. And so this initiative is trying to really represent that for children and to use language that families and children feel comfortable with. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, Bobby Thomas sits down with Hoda for a very personal exclusive interview. Hi everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, two. So grateful. Is that close to crime? Here we go. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, of violence and persecution in their home countries. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Welcome back. Today on Hoda and Jenna, an update on our fierce Spanx debate from yesterday. Plus, Hoda's conversation with Bobby Thomas, who's sharing her journey of grief and gratitude. Take a look. It's time to, for a follow-up for a very important discussion that we had. It erupted into a huge, major deal yesterday. It really did. And, and the, really, the question is that and people all over New York are talking about this morning after a debate. You know, fierce. Yeah, fierce. Is should you wear underwear under your Spanx? The answer is no. The answer is yes, okay? okay, because I'm not skanky and rank that I don't wear. Did you I, just call me rank? No, because no, because you're no, because your Spanx get rank if you My don't wear Spanx undies. Spanx get washed. When? When I choose to. How often? Once a week. You okay. know what really grossed me out, which I was thinking about since we're on this horrible topic anyway? I, know, I feel like my mom probably is turning the Well, channel. here, she's about to click off mute right now, but this this is one of those things. So my sister bought me a bathing suit. Yes. Okay. Oh, which gosh. I loved. So Jeff I got Rosen. the- Jeff wait, 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 <laughs> so, I got, so I got the bathing suit. And once you get a new bathing suit, to, for women, they have like this plastic thing that they put so that, you know, when yes. different people, so you, but here's we what you know. have to do. You have to peel it off. So somebody has to peel off that Can I tell panel you? to, and throw it in the trash. Do we, I had to do that the other day and I gotta tell you, I was triple gagging. Can I tell because you something Because you have even to get worse, rid of it. Something even worse. Okay. And this shows you how. Wait, are we about to lose all no, of our viewers? No, we're not. But just I'm hang just, on and then is, we're gonna be done yes. with this. I'm just gonna tell you, this is sort of how Ooh. speedy it is to get to the pool. Oh, like no. in my own home, yeah. I bu myself yeah. bought a new swimsuit. Yeah. I thought I looked so cute. cute. I put yeah. on the thing, yeah. I get yeah. in the pool. I'm holding yeah. 17 yeah. kids. Yeah, and? It was All still of a in sudden, there. the little plastic thing floated, floated. and Poppy goes, Mommy, you have a sticker on, <laughs> and sticker. pulled it, 
and the sticker was that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's, we're sorry, and we're not going to do this anymore no. after today. Okay. So here are <laughs> the latest numbers on the Twitter poll. Should you or should you not wear underwear with Spanx? Okay. The no. Answer, you're winning. 52.2%. I just want to let everybody know, thank you for voting for me. <laughs> I would like to thank Sarah Blakely, who created the Spank, and all of you who... Oh, is that Sarah? Is it Sarah Blakely? No, it's not. Oh! Yes, it is! Okay. I, Sarah, okay. I just Sarah. was thanking you Sarah. in my acceptance no, speech. Wait, 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 wait. Sarah, Sarah, you gotta you have to really help us, okay? I because know. I am there's there's rarely a day I don't have my Spanx on. I'm just and I just <laughs> in fact I just ordered from Dillard's the Spanx white jeans, because I love those. <laughs> However, because it's the only place that had a large. I literally went all over the internet yesterday. Everybody sold out of large those, white. By the way, I have jeans. them in black and they're fantastic. No, and they're frayed at the bottom. Okay. But back to this. <laughs> Should people wear underwear under the Spanx? Don't say anything, Jenna. Sarah, I think okay. you. Please, please, please. Okay. please. I am here to say to, to solve the great panty debate. And I have never been a lifeline on whether you should wear underwear or not before, so this is exciting. <laughs> but I will say that when I created Spanx 20 years ago, I designed them, and I'm glad you guys are talking about this because the nation's divided. But drum roll. So you don't wear underwear oh, under no. there. <laughs> call Savannah. Call my mother. Thank you. But Sarah, but, Sarah, wait, but wait, wait. There's, there's more. Okay. Listen, it's you're, you're both right no, because wait, let her look, finish. half the women wear underwear under it, and so that's fine too. But I went to great lengths when I created this for the right crotch. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know where to go for a crotch. I literally looked in the yellow pages under crotch to find the original crotch oh for Spanx. Wait, it's not you under just said crotch, crotch. It's three under... times, four times. It's okay. We can pay the It's FCC under fine. a fancy oh, word called gusset. But anyway, we have an easy access gusset, as you called a hole, oh, which oh is my hilarious. Word. Oh, my gosh. Well, that is a well, hole. Hold on. But can I ask a question? Ooh. Okay. <laughs> can I ask a question? Um, how often should Jenna be washing her shapewear given that she doesn't wear undies? And just as a side note, Sarah, not to be judgy, but she doesn't wear them with jeans either. Wait, no, That's one minute, one minute, Sarah. Let me just also comment. <laughs> I use, I wear them like I wear my heels as my girl Oprah taught me. I wear them now only for Oprah the hour. <laughs> oh, well, and Oprah agrees with me. I wear them only for the hour on the show, and then even, I usually like just let everything hang out. Even so, though, would so you just hour put a day, old underwear? But I'm underwear very clean. I've just gotten out of the okay. shower. So, Sarah, Sarah, should she, Listen, how often should she be washing them? I, I don't think week. I'm going to go there. That is such a personal <laughs> decision. <laughs> I think, I think uh, you know, Jenna's got to embrace how often she wants to wash her spangs. See, that's you good. You just be you. It. You be but you. You know what, Oda? You, you, really, you really supported me in this moment. But I also want to just thank Sarah. And I want to thank the voters. <laughs> you know what? This is not an Oscar. <laughs> you did not. I want to thank the Wait, Emmy voters. Hold up. Yes, darling. Hold up. Oh, For Lord. you. What's that? Oh, that's a thong. We created uh, undies. Spanx yeah, these are Spanx understatements, and they're like the world's best See? light thong. They're breathable. Wait, now, but did it give? I'm sorry, friends. Sarah, Wait, to interrupt on. you. Does it give you still the, the, the support? Support that us? No. no, no. This is this is it's just regular. if you don't want to wear your Spanx without underwear. Okay. We've got you covered. And can we've I, got you covered. Can I just say, y'all need understatements. Okay, I love them, but y'all need to get more of the white jeans, please. I mean, I've been on every. <laughs> I had to go to Dillard's. That was a lot. I mean, Dillard's I love is my favorite. Well, place, I love Dillard's, but as I I was going, as I was going through, I was like, oh, my gosh, the only pair of large jeans are at Dillard's, so thank you. Yeah, Don't thank forget you. Well, I, I got to tell you, I put on my Instagram last night your debate yesterday, and oh. the nation is truly divided. Mm. So this is what I'm going to do. Mm. If anybody's watching and they want to go to at Sarah Blakely on Instagram, all you do in my last post of you guys is put team panties or team no panties, <laughs> and I'm going to pick a bunch of you, and I'm going to send you Spanx. And understatements. So you're covered no matter where you fall. Okay. Well, Sarah, we love you. Sarah, thank, thank you. you. You're so much fun. You yeah, guys are hilarious. Thank okay. you for bringing this to the forefront no, of America. You know Women have been confused. It's a very important day, and we appreciate it. We, we try you to stay and... on the news, okay? That's <laughs> what we you. try to do. No, really. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. See okay. You. Bye. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Sarah. <laughs>
All right. Okay. By the way, that was the, that was the coolest. And we didn't know she was Colleen, and, and I just think during the acceptance by speech, the, she invented <laughs> this thing. By the way, she just by doing something like she did. Yes. That was such a. Can you believe, believe that she created no, Spanx? No, she's, she's an incredible she's woman. She's an incredible entrepreneur. Hats okay, off Maybe to her. we'll give a real story about her. I wake up trying to find some T-shirts that still smell like Michael. <laughs> Which ones weren't washed, you know? I've never been more in love with him. <laughs> really? More in love now. Their love story began in 2008 when Bobby first met Michael. She was fiercely independent. The idea of marriage had scared me mm -hmm. so much. I mean, even when he proposed to me, mm -hmm. I mean, he would be screaming right now. He, <laughs> I said, yes, but can I have 30 days? And I remember thinking, is he gonna like take it back? But instead he said, okay. And then two days later he woke up and he was like, 28 more days to go. And that was him. He just was so um, positive and optimistic. And he carried that through the hardest challenges that no one should have to go through. The kind of challenges traditional wedding vows include for better or for worse. With this ring. I the way. I the way. Shortly after their fairy tale wedding in 2013, Bobby and Michael publicly shared their very personal journey to parenthood. It takes a village to raise children, but to make them too. We celebrated alongside them when they revealed they were expecting. Can we say that again? Bobby oh, is pregnant. He is pregnant. Thank God. Yes. Thank God. And when they welcome little Miles into the world. But four years later in 2019, hardship would follow. I remember how jarring it was for us to learn that Michael, when he was just four years old, he's on a business trip and suddenly he collapses and you later learn that he had a stroke. My heart dropped out. I mean, you become one person and it felt so unfair. Doctors told Bobby a full recovery was uncertain, but even in the face of adversity, Michael never lost his determination. That's it. That's better. Michael recovered, and it's so important that we focus on recovery. He went from not walking, not talking, mm -hmm. to learning to talk again, getting out of his wheelchair, and actually walking. And it was unbelievable. I mean, it was really unbelievable to even the doctors that he continued to overcome. Mm -hmm and was about to return to work. But in the fall of 2020, unrelated to the stroke, Michael developed a bacterial infection. It was five weeks in the ICU and it was just one thing after the other, like a domino effect. So when things just increasingly became problematic, it seemed as if we were up against the impossible. It was multiple organ failure. And besides the very worst memory of my whole life of seeing his last I was having to look at his parents and his mom. I will never, ever be able to love anyone more deeply. And I will do anything for them and his family and his sister. His parents are the strongest. And in the face of losing their son, they were there trying to console me. Now, Bobby is trying to console others and help them navigate the very same path she's still figuring out herself. It's important to say out loud for myself and for others that you have to give yourself the grace to not try and fix it, the pain. Because so often we are in a position where you know, pain is uncomfortable. The pain is so precious to me. It's my connection to him, and it's like, I don't want the hurt to go away because it gets further away, and that sounds crazy to say out loud, but I'm starting to embrace that, and I, if I can do anything to tell other people who are going through this, because I know how alone I feel, and I have so much support, it's to not feel like the problem. The pain that, you, that you're feeling, that you're going through, the loss is fresh. It was December. See, and in my mind, yeah. I have this clock ticking and I think, oh my gosh, it's six months. You know, you should be 
you should be better, you should be fixed. And I, I really appreciate as humans that we want to do that, but it is really hard to learn how to carry something. What struck me is not only are people trying to fix your pain, your son's trying to fix your pain. Mm. He's trying to heal you. That's the most painful because I'm his mom. <laughs> and he is at five looking for solutions. Mm. One night at bedtime, mm -hmm. he asked me who invented it and why. And I thought, he was gonna ask me about a truck or yeah, something. Yeah. And he said, this life, I was stunned. Yeah. And he's like, I just don't understand why we all can't be angels. And he was still trying to figure out how we could all be together. Our week long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. That's so cool. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Welcome back to Today Talks and our exclusive content you can only see here on you know, Today All Day. You know what I you know what I'm sensing from that chair? What are you sensing? A little gloating. A little yay, look what I did. You know, yay, my America have believes never felt with me. So comfortable and just right on point. Do you know what I By mean? By the way, I gotta say, we had a lot of fun and beautiful. It was a beautiful show. It had all sorts of wonderful parts to it. A lot mm -hmm. of, um, but I was just thinking about Sarah Blakely calling in it this morning, and I thought that that was pretty cool. Wasn't to have, it fun to have her call in? Do you remember when Kathy Lee said she was the one who founded Spanx? Oh, Kathy Lee tried to say that she started the internet. Yeah. No, no, I mean, she no, no, no. She said that one day on her show, she told everybody that she took her pantyhose and cut out the oh, feet. Oh, she created and Spanx. So, but she didn't run with it. That was a whole thing. So, I mean, Sarah Blakely is Brilliant. incredible. And the truth is, you know, in the 80s and 90s, moms girdles. wore girdles. Yeah. And I remember I once borrowed my mom's girdle when I was like, sad when I was a little bit larger and I was going to a dance or something. Oh. I was too young to wear a girdle, but I wore one. And that was the birth of the spank. But that then Sarah Blakely took that girdle and modernized and, it. Yeah, I mean, the idea that you could live without those now, now it's such a, like, it's such a thing. I and know. apparently America thinks that they make fine underwear just like that. Well, because that's really what they are. And Sarah Blakely came on our show today. And don't you love when our producers surprise us? By the way, it's not so easy to surprise us no. because here's the thing. For us to go from our meeting to the show, in between, there are lots of papers that get yes. delivered to us. Sometimes you get one that you're not supposed to get that has yeah. The secret surprise. Yes. Sometimes you walk in and you'll hear a crew member say, "Is she going to be by remote?" And you're like, Who? "Who's by remote?" Or you look in the prompter you know and it's not supposed to be in it, and you go, "Oh, there's there are 15 ways to blow a surprise accidentally in and five seconds." I kind of feel like you and I are those the type that we're hunting. Yeah, we, we want to know. That we sniff things out that yeah. we should know. Because someone will say, "Oh, is she coming live?" And then everyone will go like, "Hook." And you're like, who is it? But do you know that oh. I have this problem, and I've had it since what? I was a little girl, that my expectations oh, you think something big are is huge. You. So for, for, like what? Like, for example, when we were little kids going to bed and Barbara yeah. and I shared a room and we were going to sleep, I'm like, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. And we're going to wake up, and there's going to be a heart that says, good 
cotton morning. Tomorrow you get your ears pierced. And like, no, it was like it's one chocolate happening. rose, you know? But I, so the other day I was walking upstairs and the TV screen, there was Sydney and I think Dave or yeah. Zach practicing for something and behind them was the graphic what? of the count from Bridgerton, Reggie. <gasps> So you thought, so I thought, thought he was coming that on? That he was coming on to Walking surprise on. us. And I walked in, I go, Hello. and I said to whoever, I go, looks like we busted them in that <laughs> surprise. Well, no, that wasn't that happening. wasn't it. I know, there is there are things when you overblow it, when you're like, and it's my birthday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there's a cake in your kid, which is nothing no, wrong with that. No, we want a cake and we want we a kid. Of course we but do. sometimes you think that there's going to be like, like a it. trip to the Caribbean. No, Never no. happens that way. Oh, but happy birthday, and here's your card. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, maybe it lower your expectations. Yeah, that's and a, that's, that's why today, we really didn't know, and what a cool surprise to have Sarah Blakely pop in. I thought that was cool. That we are, our producers are great. All right, that's going to do it for this fascinating and riveting episode <laughs> of Today Talks. Keep watching more today all day. Okay, guys, full confession. I got to see three episodes ah! of Girls Five Ever. Gonna be famous five ever. Uh, uh. Forever too short. Too Stop short. it. It's ah! so, first of all, it's so catchy. And truth be told, I was supposed to be on the set starting the Today Show at 7. I was in my dressing room. I was playing episode two. Yay! Played episode three. They said, come down. I gave it to Savannah in the commercial. I said, watch five minutes. You guys are the Ted Lasso for women. <laughs> no, it is it is so funny. So I, first of all, I need to know, how did you four get how did you four get chosen to be together? Because to me, this is sort of magic. Busy, why don't you start us off? It was a contest at the mall, Dakota, <laughs> and we all just showed up. No, I mean, I I feel so grateful when I saw when Tina Fey called me. Sarah and Renee were already signed on to the project, and it was as if someone in the middle of the hardest year in all of our. Oh my God, I'm going to cry. Am I crying? I'm about to cry. The <laughs> hardest year in all of our lives. Someone called me Tina Fey, the best in the world, and offered me like my dream come true. <laughs> Do you want to come and spend like the next four, three, four months working with the most incredible women um, and sing with the most talented singers and pretend that you were a pop star? And I was like, I like fell on the ground. So that's how I, <laughs> that's how I was lucky enough to join the cast. And when I read the script, I knew for sure. I, I was like, it has to be Paula Pell. If it's not Paula, I don't know what, I don't know who it is. And then we signed on for that table read and I saw Paula and I was like, yes. Paula, you are a fan favorite. I mean, every time you come up on the screen, before you even open your mouth, I start laughing. I'm like, I'm not sure what's coming, but I got to get ready. Gloria's char the character always has that look like, it reminds me of my old grandpa Joey, who was Italian that would always be like, you know what's wrong with this country? Everyone's got two cars. There, there's a lot of weight on her. She's got a lot of weight on her, but a lot of weight in her soul that she needs to un, unleash and unpeel in the series, which I love. Because like the exhilaration of, you'll see later in the episodes that, that Gloria starts really letting it rip. Oh, uh, well, she lets it rip in the first few too. That's true. She's not a shy flower in the first couple. <laughs> So Sarah and Renee, you guys were signed on first. So will you just tell me how did, how did the call come for you, Renee? Uh, I just, I got sent the pilot script and I laughed so hard and cried a little bit. Cause I was like, uh, I just, I just spit take, I just kept spit taking. I, cause I, my question was, I don't understand the title of this show, you know, in the email. And then two pages into the pilot, I was like, uh, 
<laughs> oh my god like two pages in it was just the funniest my favorite thing ever in any kind of 90s you know group movie is like that is that like is that group that group that didn't make it like that group that had like this huge moment of fame that didn't make it and to and sometimes they're just in the beginning of a movie and the fact that it's an entire series about the thing that just makes me laugh more than anything in the world is just a gift from <laughs> Meredith Scardino yes and yes. Tina Fey Sarah, your voice is bar none. I've loved you since the very beginning. The minute I heard Sarah sing, it was like a warm hand on your heart. So okay. I knew I knew music was obviously in your blood. What I didn't know was that you have that funny timing. You have that great comedic timing. So when you were stepping into this role, and this is a little unfamiliar to you, I mean, you hadn't really acted, acted in the comedy before. How did you get your sea legs? Working amongst the the sea of this beautiful community of of talented people I mean I think you know in some ways I also I think so my sister Jenny is a hilarious person and I think that I have spent my entire life looking up to her and watching her and her comedic timing and then this was like an opportunity to like practice but being so held and so supported by these, you know, these three women in particular, but also our creative team and the other cast members. It was, I, it was a really extraordinary set to be on. I think partially because we were coming to this job amidst COVID. And so there was this undercurrent of just gratitude to get to work, to be able to go to work and to be with other people and to do something creative that was joyful. All of it felt like very present to me. Um, so I think, you know, in in the context of what last year felt like, it was like leap, you know, and and hopefully the ground shall appear because it was it was a it was a big trust fall. I was very nervous to sign on and I told Tina and Meredith, I was like, I think you called the wrong person. I don't know what you think I'm like I, this is not what I do. But I had so much fun. I had so much fun. Did you guys make it through without busting up in every take? Oh my because god, we I did. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean that was hard. That was hard. I we were say. at the at the very end of the shoot. We had, I mean, it was like the last hour where we were delirious. <laughs> we had it was freezing cold outside. We were on our very last minute, and they handed us a sheet to just record something without camera, just for some like answering machine moment. And it was something that bit a line for busy that was so ungodly funny and they didn't warn us and we were so loopy and she just said the line and it was that church cry where you can't come back from it. And it's like, oh, like everyone is about to kill us because we're about to wrap on this entire season and we cannot get through it. We couldn't get through it. We just kept having to like recollect and recollect. <laughs> so, and I grew up in church, like grown up Catholic with a lot of giggle fits and uh, oh my God, we couldn't stop crying. We couldn't stop laughing, cry, cry laughing. How many of you guys saw Renee in Hamilton? Uh, oh, numerous times. So many times. Okay, come on. So you knew that she was just like a perfect human being. So oh my gosh. first meet, I mean, your role in this Renee is hilarious because I didn't, I didn't see it coming. I'm like, you play this kind of diva. You don't care. You're like, get back gnats. You're like dusting everyone away from you. Was it fun to get into that character, which is so not your personality? Oh my God, thank you for saying that. Oh, that. Um, yeah. You know, it was a stretch for me. Um, I, you know, what made it so easy. Um, I, I'll just copy, you know, Sarah, it's, it's those women and how brilliantly funny they are, but also it was the styling. What I'm most excited about this show is that style team, mm -hmm. the hair, mm -hmm. the makeup, those clothes from that time, or even, even their choices in present day, yeah. <laughs> what they wear. Um, I almost felt like, you know, don't judge my performance until they have put on this look. Um, Cause <laughs> once I stepped into that nineties, that hair, those wigs, those clothes, once I stepped into that moment, I just felt like my Sasha Fierce came out. Yeah. <laughs> And it was, uh, it was a joy. We I saw it too. It did come out. It did. I mean, I was shocked. I was like, oh, get back. So I'm sorry. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role.
Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. I joined Ellen on her set. What's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland, reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. But you guys, the singing is so on point. You all are joking the whole time. And the lyrics, by the way, get so, they're, they're such earworms. What's the lyric that is still an earworm for you guys? Oh, God. Oh. Dream girlfriends. Yeah. Dream How does that go? Yeah. I, it just dream girlfriends. Because our dads are dead. So you never have to meet them and get asked why you left school. <laughs> I mean, it's my favorite. I sing it's it so bad. Just like, like not even in jokes, doing the dishes. I'm just like dream <laughs> girlfriends. I mean, all the time, all the time I'm singing. You know, I, I worked for years with Jeff Richmond. I've known him for 20, 20, almost 20 years. And he of course, you know, was a musical uh, director at, at SNL. He wrote so many funny things at SNL. He's so talented. And then add Meredith Scardino, who's one of the funniest oh. comedy writers on earth. And the two of them with the lyrics and music together are just, and of course he did Mean Girls the Musical, but it's like on Broadway, but just like incredibly funny songs. And then of course our, our big song at the end of the, of the season is, is written by the, the incredible Sarah Bareilles that made us open mouth bubble cry, like put a bubble out of our mouth crying when we first heard it. And, <laughs> And we, we get we get to sing that we get to sing what what she wrote with these three and it is it is like a pinch me every single day doing you know, it. I didn't know. I mean, I knew. Oh, look, I knew you wrote, wrote waitress obviously, and you ended up on Broadway um, on stage that night, and I remember that too. That was beautiful. I didn't know you you wrote a song for this one too. I did. Yeah, it was you know testament to the deeply collaborative and sort of open-hearted nature of the writing team and the and the music the whole music department but Jeff in particular who approached me kind of early in the season saying you know we have this song kind of towards the end we know the concept a little bit but are you interested in playing and at that point I was a little bit just like I don't quite know what I'm doing I'm just trying to remember my lines and so I don't I don't know if I can take it on but as the season went on and just madly fell in love with everyone on set but these three in particular and then it became really fun to think about you know what would we say if you know it's celebrating the idea of being perfectly imperfect we were coming up four stars mm -hmm. instead of five stars so it's like that the idea that they find a way to celebrate themselves in all of their flaws in all of their imperfections and then it was just a collaboration I mean it was Meredith's lyrical ideas that I sort of teased out in different directions and and Jeff was at the ready to kind of, yeah. you know, ping pong it back and forth. But it was such, it was so celebratory. I felt so proud. I just, lo I love the whole concept because a lot of us uh, right now, some are in our forties, some of us are in our fifties. <laughs> and I think you guys are in those categories. Yes, um, and you feel like you, I mean, there's something about reclaiming a little bit of something. Yeah. Don't you love, I just love the whole premise, Busy. Yeah, I mean, well, for me, that was also part of, what was so incredible that I feel like so many of us of this age group, so many women, Gen X women, do feel this connection to like reclaiming your own narrative and being able to, I mean, it's something that I feel really strongly about, obviously. Mm -hmm. And to have, you know, 
look, I was, I was a teen actor, you know, mm -hmm. I, 20 years ago, I was on television and to have this sort of mirrored big comedy storyline about, you know, four women who, when they were very young, were put together and were told a lot of things about who they were and what they were capable of. And now they're adults and they're like grown women who realize well, wait, I don't have to be held to that anymore. And they mm -hmm. realize that together, which is just what I love and through supporting one another. So, I mean, the show is insane and hilarious and incredible, but then also just the heart of that and the relatability is something that I love so deeply. I, t I totally agree. Renee, your character is, uh, is put on, like she's trying to let everyone think that she's, you know, really made it big when in reality, she's got a big secret. And I think a lot of women try, you know, in real life, they try to put on a front, they put on a face, it's all BS, but they do that. They're like, you know what? I want people to think I have my stuff together. And what's that about, you know? Um, I mean, if there's anything that we should get at this age, it should be the ability to let that go. And I think mm -hmm. um, the harder it is for them to do, the more relatable they are. And when they succeed at it, um, when they succeed at, at, uh, at, at reclaiming their voice, as she said, or... Um, or just understanding that there's still value to who they are, even even in an industry that said might you know might keep saying no. Mm -hmm. uh, just that is something that we deserve. Yeah. <laughs> and we deserve it. Like in this country, we deserve it. In this world, we deserve it as women. We deserve it as women that are that are getting older and getting better. Uh, so it's it's an underdog story that has a, a victorious you know song to it that I feel is resonates even bigger than like the idea oh. that you know of of what the show. Is about. I can't. But also, yeah. wait, can I just say, like, all of us, all of us on this Zoom, I would say, have, are like in our prime now. <laughs> all, you know what I mean? And if you had told me that at age 23, I would have been like, okay, well, you can just <laughs> right. take a seat. <laughs> but I'm so great. Like, you know, I look at the work Paula does and Renee and Hoda, you and your life. And <laughs> my beautiful SB and you're, you know, and I just think like, oh, wow, this is where it's at. It's mm -hmm. not at 23. Do, do, and the audacity, you know? the audacity yeah. to think. I, I think women, I, I grew up, I grew up as a woman who holds gravity. That's my new word for size. Um, <laughs> and, and I, I really, always was living in the potential. Everyone would tell me my potential. You could be this, you could be you could be pretty, you could be this, you could be, and it was always like they were giving you some wisdom and it was so insulting, but in, in feeling horrible, but you didn't know, you just were like, okay. And I feel like women so much are always told you could, if you did this, you could, you could, you could. And really this whole, this whole story and this show and the songs and the everything and the way we take it back from the, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, sorry, men, but that kind of controlled our career and, and gave us the songs, everything. Now we're like, no, we're going to write our own songs. And, and it's kind of symbolic. We're going to write our own song. We're going to write our own story and we're going to be a complete sentence and we're going to be enough. And we're going to like, be really excited about that. You that, know, that was such an empowering moment. Uh, that moment right there that you're describing, Paula. And I was thinking, Sarah, because you guys were all in the room and he was playing some horrible, crappy demo and everyone's like, <laughs> and then finally you guys stand up and you say, no, we, we actually don't like that. And I just wondered, Sarah, like in real life, you've, you know, you've managed a music career through all this stuff. And I feel like, and I don't know if this is right, but I feel like you've always kind of been like, this is me. Take me or leave me. This is me. I think that is true. And it was not a, I think I always want to remind people that it was clumsy and like had there was so many flaws to that there were even flaws in the fact that I was so shut down to taking in anybody in a collaborative way I was so protective of losing myself that I don't even think I opened myself up to people who may have expanded my perspective or augmented my talent in some way I was so you know, my dukes were up for such a long time, but I, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. And I think at that age when I, you know, I was in my mid twenties when I started my music career and I had, I had this experience of standing up and being told like, you should sing this song called just have fun. And I'm like, I don't, 
want to. And I like left and I, of course I'm crying and I'm like, oh, it's so misunderstood in the world. And, but then it makes me write love songs, you know, like the, the places where, you know, we, we, we hit those hurdles that clarify something. That's the, that's the kind of energy of the universe that I get really excited about because sometimes you have to know what you don't want before you know what you do want. And that's I think this show really celebrates are. that. Yeah. 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 What'd you say, Paula? That's how, that's when you find out who you are, when yeah. Yeah. you are so afraid to speak up and then you speak up and then you go and cry. And then you're like, why am I crying? That's what I mean. Yeah. That's what I don't like that. <laughs> I don't want to do it. You know? Well, I am so crazy about this show. You guys, I think it's going to be a crazy hit. I mean, oh, I, I cannot think of a, a friend, a woman friend of mine who would not be glued to this, but you all are, you all, you all, it's a home run and I can't Aww. wait. So I just want to say, I, I, this is the perfect combination. Hats off to Tina and hats off to your brilliant writer on this show and just hats off to you guys. What a great combo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Love Hoda. you. Yes. All the way. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The name Busy is fitting for our next guest because Busy Phillips has a lot going on. She is a New York Times bestselling author, podcast host, actor, and a mom. Yeah. Her career took off with Freaks and Geeks, a cult classic TV series set in the 80s about friends at a, high, at a Michigan high school. Well, now Busy is starring in a new Peacock original comedy. It's executive produced by Tina Fey. Girls Five Ever. That's what it's called. <laughs> Girls Five Ever. Remember that. It follows once famous 90s pop stars who are trying to reclaim their celebrity status. Summer, you're home. Always. Oh, I just heard us during Peloton. We are back. What are we going to do? You know, Carnival has a 90s themed cruise that goes around the Pacific Garbage Patch. Oh, no, 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 and, no, no. Uh, I just have your licensing check. Oh. It expires on Friday, so. Oh, and. I brought you this baby gift that I've had for you for like five ever. That is so sweet, thank you. Oh, come, you have to meet Stevia, but don't touch her, she's not vaccinated. <laughs> this is timely. Busy Phillips up early, Hi. good to see you. Thank good you morning. for getting up. Morning. Oh, it's so great to see you. Well, guys, I'm on the East Coast now, so this oh, is Oh, that's true. Oh, so it's not that early. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is it true, is it true, Busy, that, that when this opportunity came along, you actually thought about not returning to acting? Well, the truth is that I was planning on not returning to acting. Hmm. And then <laughs> Tina Fey called me and said, hey, I have this part on a TV show where you would be playing essentially, you know, uh, grown-up Spice Girl kind of, you know. You, yeah. A girl from a 90s band, a girl group who, you know, is now in her 40s and they attempt a 
uh, come back and Sarah Bareilles and Renee Elise Goldsberry are already signed on and Meredith Scardino, who created the show and wrote the script. And I just think you are the person to play Summer. Hmm. And I guess at that point, you're like, well, I mean, you can't say no to Tina Fey (laughs) and then to ever and then to live the dream of being a 90s pop group. (laughs) I mean, I I just said I was like, I have no, I was like, I have one question. Are there flashbacks? (laughs) And she's like, (laughs) she's like, yes. And I said, do I get to play myself in the flashbacks? And she said, yes. And I was like, I'm in. I'm yeah. in. <laughs> you know, and, there, and there are so many levels to it, too, because first of all, you guys can all really sing. Like, each of you can hold your own mega concert, but put all of you guys together. So that's one. And then also, it's fun to watch. I heard you guys talking with Hoda a little earlier this morning. There's a message in there, too. I mean, you know, you're 40, yeah. you're 50, or you're 60. You can still have great things ahead of you, you know? Yeah, and I think, you know, we talked about this with Hoda, like, to me, when I look at even just the ladies on the show, when I look at so many women in my life, so many of my friends, um, they're really now hitting their stride yeah. in so many ways, career wise, family wise, uh, you know, and I I just personally feel like, you know, at 23, 24, when I started out, I mean, I started out in this business at 19, but, um, you know, I didn't know that that my 40s were going to be the thing Mm -hmm. (laughs) that was going to be the best, you know? And and look at you now. I mean, here we are. are. (laughs) So so tell us about your character, Summer. I mean, I feel like in in girls groups, especially in the 90s, they all just had that that different thing about them that made them special. What what makes Summer so special? Right, right, right. Well, yeah, I think that the typical thing in those sort of uh, put together girl groups is that they each were given a personality, Mm -hmm. right? You know, like this was who's who this, this one is like, this one's the singer. This one's the sporty one. So Summer is really like, she's very sweet. She's been living this life since the girl group where, uh, you know, she's really just been living for the past fame. Mm -hmm. She's married to a a man who was in a boy band (laughs) Um, of course. But of course, her, <laughs> yes, their daughter is um, an Internet influencer <laughs> and she has been trying to get back into the limelight basically since she was kicked out of the limelight. <laughs> so um, she's very excited about the possibility for a comeback, but she doesn't particularly have any real ideas or really can't offer much in terms of <laughs> how to make that happen, except for enthusiasm. There you go. Busy well, you Phillips. have the enthusiasm too, which we love. Busy, busy, <laughs> busy thing. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Renee Elise Goldberry is the Tony-winning actress who played Angelica Schuyler in Lin-Manuel Miranda's hit Broadway smash, Hamilton, which, by the way, in case you were wondering, it started streaming this summer. It did. I think everybody yes. knows that. But now the multi-talented actress is in the fast lane in DreamWorks' animated Fast and Furious Spy Racers. She plays Miss Nowhere, a secret agent who recruits thrill-seeking teen drivers to infiltrate a criminal street racing circuit. And guys, that, that's not enough. She's got another big project she's working with 
Tina Fey. Renee, good morning, good morning. Tell us what it's like, the great Tina Fey. I mean, she's usually right across the street from us here uh, at 30 Rock. What's it like working with her? She is one of those people, oh my gosh, now especially because she has to wear a mask. <laughs> All of that amazingness, awesomeness that she is, she comes in the room and you don't even know she's there. She's just like this brilliant person that whispers in your ear as she walks by. Um, <laughs> kind of like the best of us. She's She can be so unassuming, which is what's so amazing about her, her talent being so great. You play a role that really is a dream role mm -hmm. for, for many singers. You play a member of a girl group who mm -hmm. had a one-hit yes. wonder. Is that like yes. a, a dream? You know, it is a dream, actually. It's so funny. The idea of being in a one-hit wonder group back in the day for me seemed like I had not made it. But right now, I would love to have one hit. <laughs> this, uh, this group, yeah, it's a group of women um, who were a, had a big hit in the 90s. And uh, we end up getting another chance about 20 years later. So it's, it's the fun of watching um, slightly older women you know, reclaim their joy and reclaim their power. It's hilarious. I it's like Busy Phillips, Paula Pell, oh. Sarah Bareilles, me. Paula it's Pell a, it's is one of the funniest. Pack. I love that. And Sarah oh my Bareilles. gosh, she's so funny. Isn't she so you're, funny? You're getting a call. Uh -oh, no, you're getting you? a call. It's okay. Don't but worry. By the way, here. you said slightly older. I want to emphasize the slightly. Um. <gasps> Oh, no, today all day when it comes to Italian food, does it get any better than a scrumptious, mouthwatering, perfectly layered lasagna? I don't know. But up next on Saucy, Anthony Contrino is sharing the secret to his signature lasagna bolognese. Hint, it's all about the sauce, not the cheese. Unlike myself, I'm all about the cheese. No matter where you are in Italy, you're going to find amazing food. But if I had to pick the one city that just kills it, it's Bologna. Bologna is located in Emilia Romagna, the best food region in the world. Tortellini, mortadella, prosciutto di parma, the best balsamic vinegars from Modena, all found in this little region in Italy. But if I had to choose one dish that just blows my mind when I'm there, it's lasagna. And it all starts with a delicious bolognese. First, I'm going to make my signature bolognese. We'll take that and transform it into the best lasagna you have ever had. Hopefully there'll be some leftovers because I'd love to whip up my version of a sloppy joe. A sloppy bow. Don't get me wrong, I love a traditional Sunday sauce with meatballs, sausage, brajol, but it takes all day. It requires a million pots. You're frying, you're this, you're that. It's delicious, but nothing beats a good bolognese. All done in one pot. And once you get past the cutting of the vegetables, which is the most time consuming part, the work's all done. First, I'm going to trim my carrots and dice them. This is one of the bases of our bolognese and it's called the sofrito. In Italian cooking, the sofrito is carrots, celery, and red onion, and it's very similar to like, say, a French mirepoix. When cutting something like a carrot, it rolls. So cut a little nib off a side, and now you have a stable carrot where you can cut your cross slices. No fingers in your bolognese, please. It's a little more than we need, but I would say more is better than less. Let's move on to our celery. Mm, smells really good. I don't like raw celery, but there's something so delicious about cooked celery. See how easy it is to cut these into little sticks just because it's a straight rib. Do I tempt this all at once? 
Let's not do that to ourselves. You can see how much quicker the celery is. Last but not least, our onions. A lot of people ask me, how do you keep from crying when you are chopping onions? You don't. And honestly, red onions, and, and shallots for that matter, kill me. So, fingers crossed that I don't look like an idiot in the next three minutes. With the Italian sofrito, it's a red onion. I like a red onion. I think it gives great flavor. But you can use a yellow or a white, just not as traditional. So far, so good in the tier department. Hopefully, I didn't just jinx myself. Okay, we made quick work of those two. So that's our sofrito. And it's a little heavy handed, but I am totally okay with that. I love a bolognese loaded with the vegetables. Now my nemesis, a head of garlic. <laughs> I'm gonna try to do this in one shot today. Mm-hmm. So I'm using four cloves. I'm gonna find the four largest cloves at least. Love garlic. Must, must, must be packed with garlic flavor. So we'll just thinly slice these cloves of garlic. Set those aside. Last thing we need to do before we actually start cooking is to puree our tomatoes. You can do this in a food processor, you can do this in a blender, but it could be a little messy. So I'm using San Marzano, which are considered the best tomatoes in the world. It needs to be certified because people can just say, hey, these are San Marzano, and they're not. And they're whole peeled, which means the skins have been removed. Submerge it, because if you turn it on towards the top, you're going to be wearing it. Just wiggle it around. Make sure you get all of those tomatoes pureed. Slowly make your way towards the top, and you can see that really cool water feature, which means that this is pretty much completely pureed. And I did not make a mess. So one and two. Spoke too soon. Okay, now that we have our mise en place all done, let's get cooking. You're gonna need a big ass pot for this bolognese. So a pot like this, or even a really nice big Dutch oven works great. Just something that's pretty heavy. We'll add a couple of tablespoons or so of really good extra virgin olive oil. And then we're gonna start building flavors. First, with some pancetta. I love buying it already cubed. It is a little bit difficult to cube because it's so fatty. If you're only able to find it in chunk form, throw it in the freezer for a few minutes. It'll make slicing it that much easier. All the fat from the pancetta is gonna render right into this sauce and just add so much depth of flavor. It's like Rice Krispies. Can you hear it popping? I want to get this pancetta nice and crispy. If you don't cook it enough, it's going to be chewy. I don't want chewy. So you can see how nice and crispy our pancetta is at this point. Now to add the next level of flavor 
to our bolognese, and that is our sofrito. At this point, I'm also gonna add a pinch of salt. We wanna season this in layers. We're gonna cook this for about 10 to 12 minutes. We really want the vegetables to soften and take on the slightest bit of color, which is really gonna bring out the natural sugars, but we don't wanna over caramelize it as well. This is looking great. Time to add our garlic. We'll let this cook for about a minute, minute and a half, just till it's nice and fragrant, which is almost always immediately. Okay, so we'll give this a second and let's get our meat. I'm using meatloaf mix. Most supermarkets carry it, makes life pretty easy. But if you can't find it like that, you can just purchase all the components separately. So it's one pound of ground beef and a half pound each of ground pork and ground veal. So let's get all this meat into our pot. How attractive was that? Don't forget, season, season in layers. And now, start breaking it up. Be aggressive. This is one of those times where you want really delicate bits of meat, sort of like in a chili. We don't want big lumps here. Carpal tunnel is getting the best of me today, boys and girls. Okay. A good bolognese needs a good wine. I'm using a nice dry red wine for a bolognese. One of the best sounds in the world. Two thirds of a cup or so. Stir it in. Our meat, our vegetables, gonna start absorbing it immediately. We'll just let this cook for a minute or two to reduce slightly. Once again, that aroma, magic. It's ready for our tomatoes. Get all of that tomato sauce out of the can. Stir that tomato sauce in. Mm. Isn't it beautiful already? You can see how liquidy it is right now, but we're gonna reduce most of that off. A couple of last ingredients to throw in there. Some rosemary. I like to cut myself a nice generous sprig. Same with oregano. These are kind of on the smaller side, so I'm gonna just grab a few sprigs. More flavor, more aroma, more deliciousness and a bay leaf. Throw those in there, stir it in. I'm gonna bring this to a boil, then we'll reduce it to a simmer and let it cook for two hours. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So. It's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts.
Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Our bolognese has been simmering for the last two hours, and you can see how much of that liquid has reduced. It's a thing of beauty. Just to add a little bit more flavor, I'm gonna add some nutmeg, about a quarter of a teaspoon, freshly grated when possible. And our last ingredient, milk, two thirds of a cup. also going to change the color of our bolognese, giving it this beautiful mauve, mauve? I don't know, is that the right color? It's gonna give us this gorgeous lightened red color. Look how beautiful. Mix it all together and then give it another 30 minutes simmering, stirring every now and then, and then it is time to dig in. This bolognese is delicious on its own, and I honestly can sit here with a spoon and just eat it like that. If it was dinner time, I would cook some parpadelle and serve it with that, but because it's lunch time, I'm going to make a sloppy bow. All you need is some really good bread. This is brioche roll. It's nice and soft, and I'm looking for something soft because I want all of the sauce to kind of soak into the bread and make it sloppy. Don't be cheap. How beautiful is that? Now, put the lid on, give it a little press. Don't worry about the mess. You can see how the sauce has already found its way into that bun. All that's left is to take a bite. I can eat this for lunch any day of the week. Looks like I have a lot of bolognese left in here. Plenty to make my signature lasagna. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. I know that lasagna may sound intimidating, 
but it really just comes down to great sauces. And we've already made our bolognese. All that's left is a bechamel. That's going to be our creamy component. It's velvety, silky smooth, and really makes the dish. Growing up, my mom would make a more Italian-American version with a ton of ricotta cheese, mozzarella cheese, sometimes crumbled meatballs or sauteed ground beef. And that's delicious, don't get me wrong, but I promise you're not gonna miss the cheese in this lasagna. So let's make our bechamel. First thing I'm gonna do is get the milk. Three and three quarters cups of milk, and I'm gonna throw it in the microwave. You can warm it on a stove top. The reason we wanna warm it is if we add too cold a milk to the base of our bechamel, which is a roux, it's gonna seize and clump. We want a nice velvety sauce. Perfect, nice and warm like my heart. Next, I'm gonna measure out the flour. This is what's gonna thicken our bechamel, and I wanna have it ready so that my butter doesn't burn. This is one of those sauces that comes together very quickly, so don't walk away from it. One healthy portion of butter. Just a stick. Get that all nice and melty. Bechamel is the secret to many a good mac and cheese. It's also amazing on sandwiches, like a croque monsieur. I always feel like I say that wrong. But it is a very versatile sauce. Okay. Start off on medium, medium high heat. We don't want our butter to burn. Once it's melted, add all the flour at once and whisk to combine. From this point on, do not put down your whisk. Once it starts to foam like this, it's time to slowly add in our nice warm milk. If you add too much at once, it's gonna seize. So be a little patient. It's already starting to look nice and velvety. Whisk really well, get into the corners of the pot. You don't want to think that you're doing a good job and then comes to find out that the edges are all burnt. You have to be a little generous with the salt here. There's nothing giving it any seasoning. We don't want it to be bland. We want it to add more flavor to our lasagna. You can also increase the heat here. We do want to bring this to a boil. A boil is what's gonna activate the starches and the flour and give it the proper thickness. Once it starts boiling, two minutes of whisking, that's all that's left. That will cook off the starch that's in the flour because you don't want to taste it. And that's all there is to the perfect bechamel. See how it coats my spatula? Perfect. Now for the fun part. We're going to build our lasagna. So here I have just a standard nine by 13 casserole dish, and this is what we're gonna build our lasagna in. We have both of our sauces ready to go. The only two other ingredients that I need, some noodles, and some pecorino. Do yourself a favor, save yourself the time. No boil noodles, my best friend. Building it is really easy and also really fun. So a ladle for my bechamel, a ladle for my bolognese. Start by taking about a cup of our bolognese and putting it on the bottom of our nine by 13 casserole. This is just the starter layer. Push it all around evenly. The one thing with the no boil noodles is it relies on the liquid found in the sauces to cook. So every inch, every millimeter needs to be covered. No naked spots of noodles. So just work that into 
the corners, and along the bottom. Just like that. Doesn't the bolognese look so good? Now it's time for arts and crafts. We want to get as many noodles in this as possible by breaking them. Think of it like building a mosaic. So channel your inner elementary school self. I like to break off the corner piece just so it kind of nestles in and press it down. And then you just kind of start playing around, carefully breaking off pieces as needed to fit. And it doesn't need to be perfect, perfect, but we want to do the best job that we can. The bottom layer, this is fine for. As we build our way up and the sides taper out more, we'll be able to fit more noodles in. Save all your scraps. You never know when you're going to need them. Now we just start adding all of our layers. So more of our delicious bolognese, about a cup and a half, which happens to be three ladlefuls. Here's one of those rosemary stems. Pull that out and then start spreading. Don't forget, cover as much of these noodles as possible. We are gonna be adding some of the bechamel on top, so that will fill in any gaps. Work that all around. Our noodles are nice and covered. Time for our first batch of bechamel. About two thirds of a cup. And give it a nice drizzle. If you haven't done so, now is a good time to preheat your oven to 375 degrees. A nice sprinkling of some pecorino right on top. Little extra flavor, little extra saltiness. And now, repeat. Did it. That takes care of our noodles. Just the last layer of sauces. Okay. Kind of swirl that last top layer on. Just think it looks a little bit more fun since it's what you're going to see when you pull it out of the oven. And then just our last final bit of pecorino cheese. All that's left to do is bake this in a 375 degree oven uncovered for 45 minutes. I can't wait to dig in. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, that's so shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. 
Killer Row, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Doesn't this look amazing? Cannot wait to dig into it. This should serve eight people. This would be enough for me and my parents. You serve as many people as you want to serve with it. I like the crispy corner pieces, but I would probably make sure that everyone got a little bit if I was serving this at a party or something. Are you ready? Nervous. Wow. Not too shabby if I don't say so myself. Look at all of these layers. You can see that creamy bechamel on top, and it's loaded with that bolognese. takes me straight back to Bologna. Okay, go home now. Mine. Welcome back. Let me to ask you about the, your choice of this movie. When you read the, the screenplay for Anywhere But Here, what did you think? Well, I was really um, moved by it just because it was very, it, it was very natural um, and it really seemed to reflect the nature of a mother-daughter relationship, um, obviously on a more extreme scale because it's, it's not the average mother-daughter relationship, but um, I just felt that it was really, really honest and um, obviously the chance to get to work with Susan Sarandon and Wayne Wang, the director, was very um, attractive to me also. Natalie, let's give people a thumbnail sketch of the movie so they'll have some idea of what it's all about. Right. Well, there's this crazy, irresponsible, eccentric mother played by Susan Sarandon and her daughter, who's me, who's kind of just very centered and serious. and has kind of become the adult in the relationship and they moved to California from Wisconsin. And from Bay City, right? From Bay City, Wisconsin and um, it's their whole process of readjustment and um, learning how to to be there for each other but also be independent of each other because it's so symbiotic, their, their relationship, they're so dependent on each other. A um, lot of it is about letting go mm -hmm. and knowing when to let go and, and uh, you're right, um, they're independence and they are so different, these two women. When you first um, were approached, you said, I love it, but. Right. Well, in the original script, there was a sex scene, and I was 16 at the time, and I just wasn't willing to do that at that moment. Um, and I didn't really want to change their vision for the movie, you know, the, the director or the screenwriter, so I just, I just turned the movie down, and then they came back to me with a rewritten version of the script, which was very flattering. Um, and, and it's wonderful and it forced them to be more creative and I think the scene is really you know just as effective without you know being explicit which I think is necessary especially with young people. Susan and I actually talked about it and said it was even more effective probably yeah. than if it had been a nude scene. Exactly. Why, why, why did you feel so uncomfortable with the concept of doing a nude scene? Well um, it wasn't it actually wasn't written as a nude scene just a sex scene and I mean to be 16 and have to sit in a movie theater with your parents watching you, yourself have sex on screen is I don't think anyone's <laughs> idea of a comfortable situation. It was flattering that they came back to you, but, mm -hmm. but largely because Susan Sarandon put her pump down and said, yo, yeah. I, I, I want Natalie for this movie because all, of all she brings to the table. Well, Susan's so wonderful, and um, it's really nice to have someone who's such a supportive and generous co-star. She's just so cool to be with on set. She's really, really wonderful. And, and it shows in the movie because we're so comfortable with each other. It's very spontaneous and, and fun. 
Our Across America journey here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. That's your shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. People are talking about Where the Heart Is, a new movie that opens today. In it, Natalie Portman plays a pregnant 17-year-old whose boyfriend deserts her in a Walmart parking lot. She then secretly takes up residence inside the store. Natalie Portman, good morning. Good nice morning. to see. You. It's amazing all the things you can do inside Walmart. It, isn't it, it is. It is. You when you go to a Walmart, you realize where the idea for the book and then the film came from because you could live in a Walmart. That's right. She she sort of sleeps in the camping section, yeah. right? And and you work out and you know the fitness section. You have the food section. The you know. All the all the washing stuff. So what's very sweet though is she keeps a very specific record of yes. what she's eaten and what she's used at Walmart because she has every intention of paying the store back. Yes. Right? It's it's sweet. It's a little sad, but she's very yeah. She's a very honest girl. It's very sad. I mean, you play Novali Nation, yes. who is as I said, pregnant, who is abandoned by her redneck nasty boyfriend. <laughs> yes. In in the at the Walmart in the parking lot. I mean, it is. Um, she starts as a very sad character. It is, it's, it's a sad situation, but the, the movie makes light of it, not, not in a mocking way, but it's, it's a fun movie, I think, to watch. It's very entertaining and all these crazy, wild things happen, and it's just, it's a fun movie, I think. But at first you think, boy, who, there, how could there be a worse situation? Worse and bizarre, more bizarre. It's just the weirdest thing to be living in a Walmart pregnant Obviously, this, this role is a far cry from Queen Amidala and yes. other things we've seen you in. When you first read the script or learned about the movie itself, why did you decide to do it? What attracted you to this role? Well, I think it's a really special story about um, this girl who really is given a bad lot in life. And rather than, you know, there's two really divergent storylines. It's her story and the, her boyfriend's story. And um, they start out with, you know, really disadvantaged uh, economically and socially and and they go two different directions she you know keeps this optimism and and goodness and she ends up you know in one path and and her boyfriend kind of is just a bad guy and ends up in a completely different place and it's just it's very sweet it's it's a fable and it's I just thought it would be the kind of movie that I would want to go see and I would be entertained at so I was like this would be really fun to make she does make a, a pretty miraculous transition mm -hmm. from this down on her luck pregnant teen to a, a very responsible and talented single mother. She finds photography as yes. an outlet yeah. and really does quite well on her own. So in a way it's, it's, well actually not in a way, it's a very hopeful story on many levels. It is, it is. I think it's got, it's, it's very positive and I mean so many movies today are so cynical and trying to be all edgy and cool and, and I just thought that it was great because it's, you know, 
just unabashedly sweet and good and hopeful and, you know, not trying to be cool in its toughness, you know? It's, it's real and it's very, very sweet story. Meanwhile, you have a lot of uh, pretty impressive co-stars, if you yeah. will. Sally Field for a blip. I was sort of disappointed. I wanted to see <laughs> yeah, her she's great, uh, in, in the movie a little bit more, but Ashley Judd, Stocker Channing, Joan Cusack. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that Ashley said you all had a great time. You we must have felt like you were in a sorority of sorts. It did was you? so fun. Well, I mean, we had an amazing female cast, an amazing male cast as well. Um, James Rain and Dylan Bruno, and and we just had the best time. Austin, Texas, is one of the greatest cities in the country, I think, that I've been to, um, where we shot, and it was just so fun. And our cast was very um, close, and the crew, and you know, we would hang out on weekends. And there's a lot to do in Austin too, so. It's really fun. Meanwhile, it, this summer you're going to be busy because you're going to be shooting episode... Episode two, two. of Star Wars in uh, Sydney, Australia. Are you excited about that? Yeah, I'm very excited. It, it'll be really fun to spend the summer in Australia, I think. I, you know, I can't complain about that at all. And um, it should be exciting. I, I really know nothing yet. So, I mean, I'm just as curious as the rest of the world is as to what this is going to be about. And especially as they get ready for the Olympics, it'll be fun to yeah, be there. But what, what about combining? You're, obviously, uh, I know you're in college right. and you've got a heavy uh, workload in school. How do yeah. you do that and also make all these movies? Well, <laughs> I really, I just don't work during the school year in terms of making films. Um, I've had to do publicity because when you work during the summer, then the film comes out during the school year and you have to do publicity. But, I mean, that just takes up, you know, a few weekends during one month of the year per movie. So um, that's been a little crazy. This month has been a little hectic with this film. But, um, you know, when you go to college, everyone is busy and everyone has their... Thing that they they shine at, and all my friends and peers are just, um, you know, the best in their fields, their respective fields. So it's just, you know, everyone is as, you know, stressed and under as much pressure as I am. So well, I don't I, feel like I'm in some special situation. Well, I think you're pretty amazing to do Thank both, you. Natalie Thanks. Portman. It's always great to see you. Natalie Portman, the Oscar winner, is gracing this month's cover of Vanity Fair. She's also, of course, a leading voice in Hollywood's Time's Up movement. And Natalie is back on the big screen in a new movie called Vox Lux. She plays Celeste, a troubled pop diva who survived a tragedy and is dealing with it under intense public pressure. Take a look. It's no secret that I'm on meds for my injury and I never should have been behind the wheel of a car that night. Josie! You know, I didn't mean to upset you by that. I no. used to be treated like I was a hero. And then they start talking about me like I'm trailer trash. But that's what this show is about. It's about rebirth. Okay, <laughs> Natalie, your accent is a 10 plus. Thank How you. much work did that take to perfect that? It was it was really fun. And it was, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of, I think, people do when yeah. they become part of the public eye is yeah. kind of go back to like, I'm really street I'm really yeah. tough and like yeah. kind of exaggerate their roots. So it was fun to do. I, I mean, I, you cannot take your eyes off you oh, in this you. role, which I think is kind of like the on Jackie. Yeah. <laughs> like the, the last <laughs> one, movie role I saw you in, yeah. you were like buttoned up, mm -hmm. reserved Jackie with that soft little voice. And this is like the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah, it was fun to get to really kind of let loose and she can really be kind of a monster sometimes. And then she has moments of being like little flashes of being genuine. Yeah. And if people think this is a fluff movie about a pop star, they've got this whole thing <laughs> wrong. This has really got some heavy tones to it. Just tell everybody what they can expect. Well, there there is some violence in yeah. it. The the pop star sort of born out of this violent act and um, and as a reaction to it. And it's it's very much a reflection of the culture we're living in right now, where everything is kind of mixed together, where the pop culture news is mixed in with the acts, the violent acts, and um, uh, the director of the movie likes to call it like the pageantry of evil, that like right. even evil has become a spectacle, that it's all kind of pop culture now. It's thought provoking, mm -hmm. it's intense, and you sing and dance. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> we knew that you could rap because yeah. we've seen SNL. <laughs> well, what was that like? And these songs are from uh, Sia, the, yes. the pop star wrote them. Yes, we were so lucky to have Sia's songs because you can't make a movie without a, 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 a about a pop star without real pop songs. And she just wrote the most incredible music. And um, yeah, and I got to record it with 
one of her producers, which was really fun, and then do the dancing, which my husband choreographed, which was very Is that extra pressure do. if he choreographs it, or is it? Yeah, yeah you're nice. like, honey, I'm doing my best. <laughs> right. He's very, he's, he's very encouraging and kind and also knows my strengths and weaknesses, so you <laughs> can kind of figure it out easily. Now, is the singing part of you something you love to do? Were you happy it was in the script? It was um, really fun to yeah. do. Um, it's not something that I had really thought of as a strength of mine before, mm -hmm. but um, you see what magic the music producers do now. They can really, they're, they're mm -hmm. kind of the artist in the studio. Yeah, so maybe we, even we could sing. <laughs> Once they put a little bit of... Yeah. There's, there's, a lot of there's a lot of help they can give. <laughs> I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now, it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh, shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. There's always an alternate. Lily's the best choice. No, but she wants my role. <laughs> Every dancer in the world wants your role. No, this is different. She's after me. That is Natalie Portman in Black Swan, a performance that earned her the Academy Award for Best Actress. This year will mark the 25th anniversary of Portman's film debut, when at just 13 years old, she played what else? An assassin. Portman still is just 37 years old, but the Israeli-born and American-raised actress already has lived through the ups and downs of a long career, with a four-year break to earn a degree from Harvard University. Portman once said, I'd rather be smart than a movie star. Turns out, she's both. Natalie and I got together here in New York for a Sunday sit-down to talk about her latest movie, Vox Lux, and a lifetime in the spotlight. You can only expect crazy things to happen here. <laughs> Natalie Portman was a child star, yes, but not the kind who got her start in the Mickey Mouse Club. You went hard at a young age into some pretty heavy, serious roles. You sort of skipped the Disney years and went yeah. right into like. But that was kind of drama. an accident. Was it? <laughs> yeah. One shot, not bad, huh? At 13, I played an assassin. At 14, I played a girl who tried to commit suicide. I can't be late. But I mean, I was trying out for all those Disney things. I just didn't get them. <laughs> they were like, this one is not chirpy. <laughs> Her latest movie, Vox Lux, is about as far from Disney as you can get. I'm scared. Portman plays Celeste, a school shooting survivor who writes a song about the incident that makes her a star eventually thrusts her into the dark side of celebrity. You get, you know, the, the moment of Columbine effectively with school shooting. We hear about 9-11, there's a terror attack. What does the movie want to say about the times we've lived in now and the times we've lived in over the last quarter century? I think it 
makes us question what is the effect of pop culture and violent events being reported the same way, for example, that you can look at your Apple News and it'll tell you about a celebrity breakup right next to a story of a, a mass shooting. Does it devalue every piece of information? What did you see in Celeste that you could kind of dial into? There's definitely a certain way that young girls in particular are sort of packaged in the right. public eye where there's this combination of like innocence and sexiness. It's just a wild thing to have been a part of myself and, and also that the movie definitely looks at. Portman was born in Jerusalem and moved with her family to the U.S. as a young child. She was discovered by a scout at a pizza parlor near her home on New York's Long Island when she was just nine years old. By her early teens, Portman was sharing the screen with the likes of Gary Oldman and Al Pacino. What's impressive to me about you too is that you've kept that sort of normalcy throughout your career. School is important to you, your grades were important to you. My parents were just like education, 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 and I would come home with a 97 on a test and they, my dad would say, where's the other three points? Ooh, like that's, that's the household I grew up in. I had a big life outside of my work and I was able to find like safety and comfort in that because when I got bad reviews, when my movies tanked, when I couldn't get jobs, because I mean, over the past 25 years that I've been working, like there have been many, many times that that's been the case. Federation would not dare go that far. Starting with a big role in one of the most iconic movie franchises in Hollywood history. I will not condone a course of action that will lead us to war. Portman was in high school when she was cast in Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. You star as a teenager in this massively successful movie, you figure it opens up every door for you. But it was tough for you after that. Yeah, the film got bad reviews. I got very bad reviews, and um, it was hard to get hired on things that I cared about after that. After high school, Portman put acting on hold for Harvard. What was it like to be movie star Natalie Portman on the campus of Harvard University? You know, I think I was really lucky to have been there before social media. Actually, <laughs> Facebook was invented when I was a senior by a freshman, Mark Zuckerberg, oh, wow. um, at Harvard. Mm. So I was really able to go about my business and not have it like documented for public <laughs> consumption. And this is my home. I know it very well. That After a second Star Wars film and some indie success. Plus, I look forward to a good cry. Portman received her first Academy Award nomination and a Golden Globe win playing a stripper in 2004's Closer. Lying's the most fun a girl can have without taking her clothes off. But it was the 2010 film Black Swan that took Portman's career to the next level. A dark performance as a ballerina earned her the Academy Award for Best Actress. What did winning that Oscar mean to you in your life? I loved all the preparation, the training, and then when it came out to have people appreciate it was completely unexpected because I'd been working for probably a decade without having any kind of response in the same way. Black Swan also introduced Portman to her future husband, choreographer Benjamin Milpier. They have two young children together. I will walk with Jack tomorrow. Portman earned another Oscar nomination in 2016 for her portrayal of First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy in Jackie. How did you get into that character that people know so well? Yeah, it was really scary to take on, honestly, but I realized how fun it was and how lucky it was to have all of this material because she was so famous. There's so much video image that you can watch. There's so many transcripts of her actual speech. The White House tour, for example. Yeah, the White House tour was like an exact reproduction. Portman's impressive resume of challenging roles and her Ivy League pedigree have earned her a certain label that doesn't exactly fit. I felt like they were like, oh, she's the smart, serious one, like this kind of image of me that right. was not what I necessarily felt like. There's a lot you may not know about me. An image she likes to poke fun at. I never said I was a role model. In a popular recurring digital short on Saturday Night Live. What's a day in the life of Natalie Portman like? Do you really want to know? Please, tell us. I don't sleep, mother off that yak and that turban. Is there something out there that you haven't done that you're like, I've done a lot of cool movies, but I've never done that. Um, 
like a proper musical would be really fun. An animated, I would love to do a voice for an animated film. So Have you not done that? Never done it. Really? And I would love to. That's like oh, my real we'll, dream. We, we'll make that happen Thanks. for you. You're good. We just booked I'll you, two, you two new projects. <laughs> yeah, 10% is fine. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What changed that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. From her stunning Oscar-winning performance in Black Swan to her blockbuster role as Padme in Star Wars, there is no denying Natalie Portman's star power. Soon she'll be picking up the hammer as Thor and is actually in Australia as we speak, preparing for the next installation in the Marvel series. So Chanel and I recently caught up with her to talk about that as well as her newest creative endeavor. She updated classic children's book stories for her new book, Natalie Portman's Fables, and she had a special audience in mind for this project. Take a look. Tell us about the modern twist you put on it and why you decided to do that. I feel so grateful to have a son and a daughter and to experience the ways that people give books and the kinds of books that they give to each of the kids was, was really eye-opening to me because my son just got kind of like the classic books as gifts and my daughter kept getting these like feminist baby books. <laughs> and I love the feminist baby books. I think they're great. Um, but I also thought, okay, the boys need this message as much as, if not more than the girls. And also, maybe it's a little early to introduce to either of them um, that girls have obstacles, because it's not in their heads as kids. So I wanted to retell um, the city mouse and the country mouse, the three little pigs, and the tortoise and the hare, with um, the same values intact that seemed like great things that I still wanted to pass on to my kids, um, but with characters that reflected what the world um, is really like. I thought it was so interesting that you believe, you know, reading, for example, can help build empathy, if you will. You know, how did that factor into the creation of this book? I mean, it's an unusual thing to think about that you're spending your time feeling sad for someone who's sad, feeling joyful for someone who's joyful, feeling fearful for someone who's going through something scary. That is the basis of empathy. Um, and so when we are giving children um, the, these practices of caring about other people's lives and those characters are predominantly male, what does that do to both our boys and our girls at those in between? Um, what does that do for them in terms of the way they go into the world? What do your kids think about the book? And I mean, just everything you're doing, are you just mom to them or are you superwoman like the rest of us think you are? <laughs> That's very kind, but I definitely am mainly inspired by trying to impress my kids right now. So, um, you know, my son, my nine-year-old is like the coolest thing I've ever done is the soccer team. We, you know, we started this women's soccer team in Los Angeles, um, Angel City, that um, he is so excited about. And it's, it, he was really the inspiration for me behind it. Because again, it's a similar story where when I saw my son look up to the female soccer players, as much as the male ones, like he was talking about Megan Rapinoe in the same breath as he was talking about Lionel Messi. I was like, that is culture change. 
and my daughter's three and a half, so she's like prime age for the book. So that's been super fun to get to read um, with her. And she really loves um, choosing which story. So the table of contents is, you know, usually not necessary for like a three story <laughs> book, but I really wanted it there because she likes to direct. Aww the order we know you've been you know discussing books on instagram you've been cooking a lot uh what what else have you been doing to, to keep yourself busy and sane i have to be honest that there's like obviously many moments where we're like i don't know what to do anymore here watch a movie you know i think we're, we all get to those points and it's really I know it's frustrating for me when I see people who are like, look at how well I'm doing quarantine, you know? <laughs> so like, I've had days that I've been like proud of myself that we've like done a craft and like cooked something interesting. And then there's been days that I like don't know how to get out of bed. Uh, I want to pivot just for a second. I know Marvel is very secretive about what they do. Is there anything you could share with us about Thor? We hear your training. That's all I know is that you're, you may be building some muscles, but I don't know anything. We don't know. <laughs> I definitely am training. It's very exciting. Although I'm a little worried. I like having kind of like soft pillow mom arms that like my kids can <laughs> sleep on, you know? And I'm like, what's gonna happen? <laughs> I'm so early in the process, they're still really like soft and mushy, <laughs> but I think at some point, some point they're gonna get like uncomfortable to sleep on. Um, so I think that's when I know I'll have succeeded with my training when my kids are like, oh, move your arm, mom, that's terrible. <laughs> She was delightful. She I was. I should tell you guys, you know, you mentioned at the top that she was in Australia. So Dylan and I, we talked to her. It was around 7 o'clock at night. For us. For us. And for Natalie, it was like, what, 10 a.m. 10 a.m. the next day. Wow. Yeah. I kept telling the shh. I was so nervous. I was like, what about Natalie your kids in the background? Everybody be quiet. Yes. I'm working on soft, pushy dad oh, yeah. belly. <laughs> dad belly. <laughs> so your kids can just snuggle just right Just snuggle up. up. Right? Yeah. Uh, the book, again, is Natalie Portman's Fables. And for more, head to today.com slash. Well, this morning we are talking all about our expectations and how those expectations could be sabotaging our happiness. Devon Franklin is a preacher, motivational speaker, and film producer. He's produced box office hits like The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith and Breakthrough starring Chrissy Metz. He is also a New York Times bestselling author, just releasing his fifth book called Live Free, Exceed Your Highest Expectations, and he's here to help us understand all about it. Devon, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? We're great, doing great, great. Better for having you here. Uh, so, so let's wow. break this down. The, the title of the book, Live Free. What, do, what does that mean? It means that we are not under the mental, emotional, or physical control of anyone or anything. Too often, we're living the life that's expected of us. We're trying to help everybody be happy. We're doing everything everybody wants us to do, but we aren't doing what's in our heart. So when we live free, it means we set our own expectations. We don't let anybody else outside of us determine how we feel and determine how we live. That's what it means to live free. Devon, you exude such light. I, really quickly, I just want to say something. Uh, full disclosure, Devon and I share a, a mutual really good friend. And 25 yes. years ago in college, she kept talking about this guy in high school who was a light and he was this amazing speaker and he had all of these goals. And for decades, I've watched you set these goals and uh -huh. knock them out of the park. So I just want people to know, uh -huh. you know of what you speak <laughs> because you're just killing it. Oh, um, so you, it, it grabbed my attention when you talk about the dangers of expectations in all categories. Yeah. What do you mean by that when you talk about being mindful of setting these high goals? Yeah, because see, what happens is with expectations and listen, the reason why I wrote this book is because I've suffered from high expectations and the disappointment when certain expectations are not met. And what expectations do is it puts our attention on a future that doesn't exist, sometimes at the expense of the present that does. And one of the things that I realize is that if it's not in our control and it's not communicated, we can't expect it. Mm -hmm. And so there were so much, so many things I was expecting in my life that I didn't control and I was driving myself crazy. So I said, oh, okay, I need to start setting expectations correctly. If it's in my control, I can expect it. And if someone else is involved, I got to communicate it. 
That's what it means by setting expectations so that we aren't getting devastated when certain things don't manifest. I want to, want to talk about your, your, your friend and former boss for a moment, uh, Mr. Will Smith. Perhaps you've, <laughs> perhaps yeah. you've seen this, this picture uh, that he posted on, on Instagram recently showing off uh, his, his pandemic bod, his dad bod. Yeah. And he's vowing to get his health and wellness oh, back yeah. on track. So, Devon, what's, what's your advice to, to him or anybody else who might be making new health goals post-pandemic. Yeah. yeah, you know, I talk about this in the book. I have a whole section that's called The Process is the Result. Mm. So, you know, you see that picture of Will mm. or you have an idea of how you want to look. And sometimes we focus so much on the result that we overlook the process. Mm. If you want to get a result, you got to control the process. That means you control your discipline. You control what you eat. You control how often you work out. That is That process will ultimately produce the result. So try to release the focus on the result, focus on the process, and usually you'll do even better than you expect. So Will is a process master, so I have no doubt. The He'll brother go get it yeah. together. He'll be, yeah. He'll be all right. Uh, uh, so Devon, you and your wife, actress uh, Megan Good, you're celebrating nine years of marriage this year. And yeah. you say that marriage is actually uh, an expectation negotiation. So what does that mean? Yes. Listen. Uh, unspoken expectations are relationship killers. Mm. And so often, I talk about this in the book, so often we have these unspoken expectations of our partner. Mm. We don't ask them if we can expect it. We get mad when they don't meet it. Preach. And then we judge their intention incorrectly. Preach. So <laughs> Megan and I, come on now, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Megan and I have had to negotiate our expectations. I've had to learn to communicate, hey, babe, can I expect this of you? She's had to learn to communicate, and hey, can I expect that of you? Because so often in relationships, we just think because they love us, they know. It's not true. Mm -hmm. Love does not give us the ability to read our partner's mind. we got to communicate. And in this book, I talk about the necessity of communicating as a way to set expectations correctly. Well, Devon, it's a lot of great advice. I know you have to come back. to read the book. Mm -hmm. really, yeah. really appreciate it. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Women are juggling more than ever. We wanted to talk to a couple of ladies who can relate. NBC Universal Vice Chairman Bonnie Hammers. Love Bonnie. A television veteran <laughs> and was recently named Executive of the Year by The Hollywood Reporter. She's also a mom. And also with us today is psychiatrist Dr. Nina Vanson, who is Chief Medical Officer of Real, a woman's mental health company. We're going to talk to both of these lovely ladies in just a minute. But first, take a look at how a woman's pursuit of happiness is as elusive as ever. There's no doubt that women today are in many ways better off than our counterparts 50 years ago. We're better educated, better paid, but in 2021, are we happier? This is me being honest, me being true. Am I happy? To be honest, no, but things have been so terrible and, and unimaginable this last year. Oh no, a big resounding, no, I'm not happy. And I gotta tell you something, I'm very ashamed to tell you I'm not happy. 
The subject of women and happiness has been on the mind of writer Aubrey Hirsch for some time. In 2019, she created a cartoon for Vox Media illustrating the paradox of women's gains over the past several decades versus their apparent unhappiness. I've been that woman just trying to do everything at once and finding it really impossible to do or to do everything well. So then you finish your day and you get in bed at the end of the day and you think, man, I failed at everything today. None of that went right. The past year has been challenging. Women have fared worse than men in a difficult job market, all the while taking on increased child care and schooling responsibilities, adding to a workload within the home that was already unbalanced. Women still are doing twice as much unpaid domestic labor as men. And until, you know, men are really stepping up and helping us in that sphere of our lives, I don't think that we are going to feel content. Who's most likely to? Eve Rodsky is the author of the best-selling book, Fair Play. Once men do more in the home, they're more statistically likely to continue to do more in the home. So what do women need to make life better and happier? So if I'm here to tell you that happiness is the uninterrupted attention for something you love, I mean, understanding that you deserve a permission to be unavailable. And you take that, you claim that time back. That's, that's a true boundary, and that's the boundary we need to rediscover our happiness. Okay, welcome women. So yeah. I think the first question is, why are we so unhappy and what can we do? Yeah, we've got Bonnie with us. And uh, Bonnie, here's, I, I think this is, a, this is an important thing because I was thinking about you actually in this moment. You did all that stuff that that mom was talking about. You're raising your child. You were in, you're in charge here at NBC. You're trying to decide, should I take my kid to camp or go to a big meeting? You were constantly juggling all those things. But in all of that, in the weeds, how did you find happiness how were you able to find your center well I think the first thing you have to realize is nothing is ever balanced everybody yeah. says you have a life you know work-life balance there's no such thing as balance one day or the other <laughs> you're either working too much or you're home too much and you never feel great about it so you have to find something that gives you a sense of quiet and peace mm -hmm. to just kind of ground yourself for me when I was younger I was a runner Mm -hmm. Now I'm like a, if I could say jogger, I think that's <laughs> but somewhere between walking and jogging. Um, and I, I just try to get some quiet time outside without headphones, without music, hmm. just thinking. Yeah. But people have to realize there's no such thing as true balance when you're working and juggling a family. Mm -hmm. Dr. Vassen, I, we have talked over and over again about how challenging this mm -hmm. year has been, and particularly for women. I wonder what you've heard. I mean, we got to talk this morning mm -hmm. in the earlier hours with an incredible panel of women, and they just said that they aren't as happy, that they're mm -hmm. balancing so much. And, and Bonnie, I agree with you, balance yeah. isn't even the right word. They're holding all of these plates, and something is going to fall, and then mm -hmm. they feel bad at the the end of every day. What have you heard? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, right now, if we think about the issue, the culprit here is impossible expectations. Yes. For women in the world, there's immense social pressure to be good at everything. Mm -hmm. We have to be physically beautiful, kind, successful at work, and, and the perfect daughter, wife, mother, and friend. And the problem is that women feel like if we aren't succeeding in everything, then we're succeeding in nothing. Yeah, and Bonnie, I think part of it is, I think a lot of women don't even really want to delegate because they're like, no, I got it, I got it, I got yeah. it, I got it. But delegating is probably one of the things we should be better at. Yeah, it, it's a hard thing to learn. You know, what, what I think is also happening as mm -hmm. culture and society puts a lot of pressure on women, I, I kind of call it, call it the glass bubble. We've all heard about this proverbial glass ceiling, mm -hmm. but right now there's also a glass bubble that's holding women in, in the house, mm. in charge of the work, uh, housework, mm. chef, in-home teaching, schooling, everything. And that's putting so much more pressure on women right now in terms of what they do and what they have to get done and what they're trying to make happen for themselves. It's a very tough time for people to kind of have a sense of peace 
and know what they want to do and where they need to go. We're going to continue this conversation. I got to say that Bonnie in the executive suite wore her leather pants mm -hmm. and did exactly what she wanted, <laughs> didn't change a thing. We're going to come back. We're going to visit again with these two lovely ladies. We'll be back after this break. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> Hey now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We are back with NBC Universal Vice Chairman and one of our favorites, Bonnie Hammer, mm -hmm. and psychiatrist Dr. Nina Vossen, who are here sharing some advice about how women can be more joyful. Mm -hmm. Dr. Vassen, we got to speak with some incredible women this morning, and the one thing they all said is that there's so many blurred lines mm -hmm. now. Like, you, the computer's always there. Mm -hmm. Work is always there. Right. Our kids are there. There's no time right alone, if mm -hmm. you could give us a few keys to helping n make those lines less blurry, but yeah. also to create joy, what would you say? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think this comes down to how can you ask for help? And it starts with being comfortable asking for help. When I talk to my patients about this, many of them say they don't want to ask for help because they're worried they'll be a burden to others. So we do a thought exercise and I ask them, how do you feel when other people ask you for help? And consistently they say they feel good, helpful and needed. So we can infer that others likely feel the same. Now, part of the issue here for women is that as a society, we need to recognize that delegating takes a lot of time and effort, mm -hmm. especially for high stakes tasks that women tend to do, like taking care of a child, parent or sick family member. It's really like a whole second job. Mm -hmm. um, so, Bonnie, that, that's interesting. I was just thinking about you came up and you, you know, you you're now like at the top drawer of NBC and going up through it. Um, I just wondered because women and men too, I guess, compare themselves to others. You know, they're like I need to be more like that or I need to be, be more like that. But I think there's something about finding your inner voice before the commercial. I said Bonnie showed up to meetings in her leather <laughs> skirt because you're Bonnie. All right. You're going to do what you want. But did it take time to get there? Did you have to conform on until you had your own voice or did you always kind of do it yourself? No, it did. And one thing in terms of um, what was just said as well, women tend to be perfectionists. So delegating and letting go is very hard. Um, so you, we all have to give a, a little bit of that away and in a work situation, unless you delegate, you can't grow other people. So that's important. But confidence, the ability to dress the way you want, the ability to get that yes in the room in your own voice rather than trying to echo somebody else's voice is very important. But it takes time, it takes confidence, and it takes a belief that um, your own self is good enough. And unfortunately, because of Instagram and Facebook and all of these sites that women, people in general, go on to compare themselves against others, and so many of those images on these sites 
aren't necessarily real. They're enhanced. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's a lot of tweaking that goes on. <laughs> so people are comparing themselves to images and people that are not real. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think you have to find out who you are authentically and be comfortable with it. Hey, and then take the strengths that you know you have and use that and push that forward. Bonnie, can we ask you something totally off topic for one second? Do you mind? <laughs> so, uh, yes. well, surprise. Yeah. No, but you were at uh, the royal wedding. Um, you know, friends with Meghan Markle, and just, we were just curious, we were sitting here thinking about, I wonder what Bonnie thought uh, when you watched that interview. I know she was on Suits, you were in charge of USA and everything else at NBC, <laughs> and that was the show, that was where Meghan Markle's television show was. Um, so what did you think, what were your impressions of what she and, and Harry said? You know, I thought it was amazingly compassionate. I thought it was authentic. I thought it was um, painful to watch and hear. You know, obviously I know Megan, and we do keep in touch, and I knew it'd been tough for her, but I had no clue what she was going through to that degree. And to go through that kind of struggle, feeling that you don't have a loving network to support you, has to just be brutal. Mm -hmm. You know, I know when she worked for us, for USA, on the show, she worked hard, she, you know, showed up, she showed up with a smile, we asked her to co-host certain things outside of the show, she would be there with a smile, she was part of the Erase the Hate campaign, more than willing to get involved, so I'm a big supporter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think it actually does go hand in hand with this mm -hmm. conversation. We never know the pain mm -hmm. that any of us are going through, and I think particularly women. And so thank you both so yeah. much. For and we keep saying we love Bonnie, but Dr. Nina Vossen, we love you too. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. Thank, thank you guys so much. <laughs>
I have learned this life can be beautiful if you make it beautiful. 80 years ago, I didn't think I will have a wife and children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And this is a blessing. Family, he says, is key as our friends. Friendship is priceless. Shared sorrow is half sorrow, but shared pleasure is double. <laughs> Truths hard earned from a man entitled to bitterness and resentment. I speak about happiness. I speak what life can be. If you're healthy, you're a multi-millionaire. And that is happiness, says Eddie, a choice available to all of us. I want to make this world a better place for everyone. I want everyone to take a step back and say, we are here for all of us. What a message in this time wow. as we're all in a kind of a state of recovery. You mm -hmm. see what this man endured. He walks into Auschwitz with his parents. He never sees them oh. again. Mm. Never sees them again. I want that book. I want to take that book off your lap. <laughs> and there's a lot of pages <laughs> oh, marked it, yeah. underlined. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, great beautiful. stuff. And what he said about friendship yeah. as well. Uh, we should mention that uh, Eddie's book, The Happiest Man on Earth, that book is out right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank he you can have love in his heart, surely yeah. everyone can. Yeah. Right? Can I read one Amazing. little section? Yes, please. A second? Okay. He says, life is not always happiness. Sometimes there are many hard days. But you must remember that you are lucky to be alive. We are lucky in this way. Every breath is a gift. Life is beautiful if you let it be. Mm. Happiness is in your hands. Mm. Oh. That's good. <laughs> Stop doing this. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Our Across America journey Here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. There's only so much we can take. Lori is a professor of psychology at Yale with one of the most, probably the most popular class. It's called The Science of Well-Being. She's also the host of the Happiness Lab podcast, who, who says the secret to happiness is not focusing on yourself, but of course, focusing on others. Lori, boy, I mean, ju just watching how you touched our previous guest was, I thought, really, really moving. And is that really what it's all about? It's like just being of generous spirit, giving back, you you know, in a moment when you could be feeling blue and kind of bummed out. Yeah, I mean, Louis kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, he said that the secret to a well-lived life is doing for others. And that's really what the science bears out. The science suggests that we don't get happy by just focusing our, on ourselves. We actually feel happier if we're doing nice things for others. Mm -hmm. and I think this is important because sometimes we can get a misconception here. We think that like spending on ourselves or like doing something nice for others is kind of like transferring our happiness. Like we do something nice for somebody else and it feels worse ourselves. But the data just suggests that's not the case. Like when we do for somebody else, we make their day, we make our own day, we promote social connection. It's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. You know what, we, we talked about Oprah, one of our favorite people at the beginning of this show, and what she said is it's not like these grand gestures. Mm -hmm. Like don't think of it as a one-time thing. Think of tiny little things you can do for people throughout your day. Mm -hmm. Do you have some examples of things we could all be doing? 
Yeah, I mean, something just as simple as like texting a friend to say, you know, I'm thinking about you. I'm really grateful that you're in my life. Mm. You know, that takes like three seconds. It's completely free, but that can make somebody's day. And it's the kind of thing that can, again, it can sort of snowball, right? If you do that, then you give someone else the permission to express their gratitude to someone else, right? You know, just the simple act of checking in on somebody, making them feel like they're valued can be Mm. incredibly powerful, especially right now. And I think too, some people are feeling, sometimes when you're feeling really blue, you're not thinking about that. Like you just, you just feel like getting under the covers. Yeah. And I think some people, and also when, when you yourself have lost a job or you yourself are in the mud, really in bad straits, sometimes you feel like you don't have the juice to do the things you're describing. Yeah, but one of the amazing things that the science suggests is that the act of reaching out to others can make you feel like your bandwidth is bigger, right? Mm. On a really crummy day, if you actually reach out to someone else and help them, and they express, oh, thank you so much for reaching out, that kind of gives you the psychological oomph to kind of face the nasty stuff ahead. Like, you actually bolster yourself by Mm. doing things for others. One of the things that Hoda and I have been talking about, just, you know, the two of us, is that we've had so much more space Mm -hmm. to think about what fills us up, and not a tip you say you say after you do something you know give yourself a moment to think does this make me feel good right yeah and I think this is this is a a tip that I give my students all the time I I often use the analogy of food right like what feels nutritious what kind of feels healthy and like after you send that text to a friend or after you do something nice for a neighbor after you donate to charity take a moment to see like how did that actually make me feel like and that feels really good right or how do you feel at the end of the day how do you feel when they write you back and say thank you like those are the moments that really impact our happiness and that impact our lives but but you're totally right we need to take these moments to actually notice notice that this is like boosting us up rather than making us feel more stressed i think there's so much need that sometimes you even feel overwhelmed with where to start i was just telling jen i saw a story about a woman up in harlem who has this food truck and she's she called herself food insecure and it broke my heart and you hear 50 stories like that a day and sometimes when the wave is so big you think well what good is my Mm -hmm. little thing gonna do you know and and is it something that's really important yeah, and I think this can be critical, right? Because I'm, I and I get this too, right? You know, there's so many tough stories out there, right? It can feel like your one action can't help, mm-hmm. but that subtle text that you send to a friend, or that like you know five dollar donation that you give to a good cause, that can actually like spiral into something much bigger. And that's why I, I love Louis' story so much, right? It just started with him kind of doing something nice for the neighbors. It became a thing that the whole community mm-hmm. was taking part in. And now he's on your show, right? Millions of people have heard this. It's going to like spread even more. And so I think that's the thing we realize. We can get stuck thinking, you know, it's just a tiny thing. But those tiny things can turn into much bigger things. Yeah, and we just need to have faith that they will. Always a ripple effect. June is LGBTQ plus Pride Month, and this morning we are kicking off the series marking the milestones of the community and also the ongoing struggle for equality. You know, we start with the journey through the HIV AIDS epidemic, nearly 40 years to the day since the first case of AIDS was diagnosed in this country. NBC News Now anchor Joe Fryer sat down with those who lived through the crisis. Joe, good morning. Hey there, good morning. So it was June 5th of 1981 when the first five cases of a mysterious disease were first reported a disease that would later become known as AIDS. Since then, the disease has claimed more than 700,000 lives in America, and today more than 1.1 million people in the U.S. are living with HIV. Now, many are undetectable, healthy, and thriving, including actor Billy Porter, who recently became public with his diagnosis. This morning, we want to reflect on four decades of pain and progress. At first, the deadly intruder did not have a name. The lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. But it quickly developed a reputation. And the deaths kept coming and coming. The fear was palpable. I was terrified of passing on HIV to someone else. But in the years that followed, it was pretty miraculous for me. So was the bravery. Because of them, I can live a healthy and happy life. We sat down with four gay men from four different generations, all living with HIV. The oldest is Jesse Myland, who's still haunted by the beginning of the epidemic. People who, because they had been diagnosed, suddenly disappeared. And and we all knew what that silence meant. Jesse was diagnosed in the 80s after losing his partner, George, and so many others. It was hard. 
It was very hard. At the time, many leaders were accused of ignoring the crisis because it was deemed a gay disease. President Reagan didn't give his first major speech on AIDS until 1987, six years after the first diagnosed case. We must have a definition of AIDS. For Dr. Anthony Fauci, the epidemic was a turning point. In 1984, he became the nation's top infectious disease expert, the same job he holds today. When there is resistance, was it hard to get the resources you needed? Well, in the beginning, it was. I mean, we, we, we were trying to convince people that this was not something that was going to go away. This is something that was going to get worse and worse. To raise awareness, the AIDS Memorial Quilt was unveiled on the National Mall. Joe Fratini. His organizers read the names of those who died. Some shared their stories publicly, including actor Rock Hudson, Teen Ryan White, who tested positive after a blood transfusion, real world star Pedro Zamora, and basketball legend Magic Johnson. In 1995, a combo therapy known as the AIDS cocktail was ushered in, followed by even better medications offering hope. But there was no cure for the stigma. Right now, there are millions of people with HIV suffering from social rejection because they and other people believe that they're infectious and, and they're not. Diagnosed in 2003, Bruce Richmond says he was terrified of giving HIV to someone else. So I, I didn't love. I just, I, I isolated myself. I was depressed and at times I was, I was suicidal. But then he learned medication could reduce his viral load to undetectable levels, meaning he couldn't transmit the virus. So Bruce started an advocacy group and coined the phrase, you equals you. Undetectable equals untransmittable, a message endorsed by the CDC. So it gave me hope. It meant that I could be, I could be intimate. People with HIV can live healthy lives and, and not pass on the virus to anyone. And that's a revolution. Today, about 38,000 Americans are still diagnosed each year. DeAndre Moore was 19. I remember staring at a window covered in butterfly stickers. In that moment, all I could think was, damn, if, if I could be one of those butterflies and just fly away from here, then everything is going to be OK. Ray F. Durazi had a similar reaction. He was 27. So I knew next to nothing about what it meant to be diagnosed with HIV. It was a steep learning curve. And what did you learn? <laughs> well, I learned that I'm not going to die. I'm, I'm alive and well. You think back to that moment with the butterfly. What would you tell yourself in that moment? You're going to be OK. You're going to be just as beautiful. <laughs> Today, all four of these men are undetectable. And all are advocates, sharing their stories to educate the public and fight the stigma. It's taken us 30 years of the AIDS crisis to teach the whole world that our lives and our loves are equal to everyone else. It blows my mind just how far we've come and then just what's possible now, so. What, what is possible now? <laughs> my mind immediately says what isn't possible. That's the answer. Another key breakthrough in recent years, PrEP. It's a daily pill that people who are HIV negative can take to prevent getting the disease. As for an HIV AIDS vaccine, well, that has not happened yet. But Dr. Fauci tells me he is cautiously optimistic that someday we will have a vaccine that is successful. 26-year-old DeAndre Moore, who you saw there, hopes that he is someday going to be part of an AIDS-free generation. And we want to give a big thank you to three organizations that helped us with that story there, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, AIDS United, and the Prevention Access Campaign. It's incredible mm -hmm. to see how far we've come in those decades. We all remember those scenes mm -hmm. in the 80s, but there still is a stigma. Isn't that what you learned? Yeah, there is. And it's actually kind of amazing, especially with young people, which is surprising. So a recent survey of HIV-negative millennials found that nearly a third of them say they avoid hugging, talking to, or even being friends with someone with HIV. People living with HIV often report being hesitant still to openly share their status because they fear losing friends or family or they even fear abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental. Just reminds us of Billy Porter just, just last week yep. who, just, who just announced what it. What a big and, sign of bravery yeah. even now. It's needed now, right. just as more than before. And he waited 14 years, <sighs> waited to tell his mother, mm -hmm. so that stigma is still there. Right. Yeah. Joe, thank you. Story. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe.
Hi, I'm Greg Luganis, and happy Pride to everybody. The most powerful aspect of being a part of this community is really learning about the other letters and getting to know people whose path has been so different from mine and sharing in pride those paths that we walk and those journeys and share the experience and share our knowledge with them. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. The Tenacious Year Corner Ranch is the dream, really. It lives up to the goal of queer liberation. I'm Penny Loke. I started the Tenacious Unicorn Ranch in 2018. The Tenacious Unicorn Ranch is a haven for trans people and an active ranch. Uh, we have alpaca, sheep, ducks, chickens, dogs, cats, creating places where we can be not only ourselves, but safely ourselves is critical to not only mental health, but just survivability of queer folk on this planet right now. The best way to describe it is like what cis people feel like when they just exist in the world. That's what we get to experience in places like this, where we don't have to constantly be worried and checking around ourselves if people are going to be violent or disagree with the fact that we're alive or let us know how weird and other we are. It creates an environment where we get to be not only ourselves, but like around other people that are like us. There is an inherent danger placed upon living as trans. There will always be bigots uh, anywhere you go, no matter how nice of a city, someone might decide to hurt you. And there's just the need to feel safe from that experience and know that you're going to be okay to exist as you are. Growing up, I always knew that uh, the suburban lifestyle really wasn't for me. I needed uh, a little more space, a little more privacy, a little more animals in my life. <laughs> uh, it has been a wonderful shift to be able to live and in the environment that I always knew was, was more, I was more suited for. I came out when I was 35. The first probably seven months of my transition, I tried to do it by myself and floundered. I needed something and I didn't quite know what. I found a group in Boulder and so I found community in that support group. I got shown this world where it doesn't have to be awful your whole transition. And that light went off in my head of like, this needs to be for everybody. To offer a slice of that for as many people as I can, it's a big part of what we're doing here. Finding work, finding community, finding basic amenities, keeping shelter, is difficult for trans people, not because we're unwilling to work or we don't want to be a part of society. It's because those doors are being shut at a very rapid rate for trans people. It's a hard road for something that's very simple and should be beautiful. It's made into something that's derisive and can oftentimes cost you everything. And I wanted to correct that. I wanted to create somewhere that trans people 
didn't just survive, but thrive in. And you can't do that without work of some kind. We have 170 alpaca. They're absolutely magical little critters. And anybody who like has met an alpaca gets why you want a ranch full of alpaca. <laughs> They're self-sufficient. They're a really easy ranch animal. And they produce a product, they produce fiber, uh, which we turn into yarn, hats, socks, dryer balls, insoles, all kinds of fun stuff uh, that we can then take to market. And we have people from all kinds of walks of life, all kinds of backgrounds that live here currently. There was something exciting and something that felt like a calling coming out and helping people like my wife, who may not have had the same support that he had, getting out here and providing a service that a lot of people don't get the opportunity to experience. How could I say no to that? People do come and go. We aren't necessarily a forever home for everybody. Um, I think that some people come up and seek just like some peace and some healing space. We, we do have emergency facilities on ranch as well uh, in case people are close to homelessness or in a situation where they're in physical danger, which is sadly common in trans communities. We'll go pick people up and bring them here, get them established and healing, and then they go back out into the world when they're kind of back on their feet. I've gotten at least one surgery for, uh, while living at this ranch, and I was able to like recover on the ranch uh, among people who understood a lot of my discovery of myself. I was able to like experiment with who I was, like like find the real me among people who like understood what was going on. It's important for people, and you can see it in their faces, their actions, that life is becoming better for them, that they can relax, their shoulders drop, the stress melts away and you, you feel people finally become themselves. It's just instant acceptance and validation and not even a single questioning or anything. I started to realize the importance of visibility. For those of us who have gotten established to show others that uh, it is okay, that there's nothing wrong with you, other people like you exist. Literally everything is better when you discover who you are and you start living that way authentically. Happy Pride Month. My name is Manny Anyway, and I just wanted to share a quick little Pride moment with you guys, my favorite moment ever from Pride. And I would have to say it's actually my first Pride ever. This huge, amazing, massive community of so many people celebrating who they are, who they truly are. Just getting to express themselves was truly such a eye-opening and awakening experience for me. That has to be one of my favorite Pride moments I've ever had. Ah. Ready actors! An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So, it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> Yeah. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. I joined Ellen on her set. What's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? 
The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hello, everyone. My name is Elijah Day. I use he, him pronouns out of drag. And during the day, I'm a client engagement coordinator and a direct support professional. And I work with the IDD population. And that stands for Individuals with Intellectual Developmental Disabilities. And during the night, I'm the fabulous drag performer, Alicia Day. And I use she, her pronouns in drag. I first started drag at the age of 19 in college and there was a drag show fundraiser. The queens were student queens and they weren't the best. So I was like, you know, I can do that. And in fact, I can do that better. What I love about drag is I am the boss lady. So during the day, <laughs> I don't look as glamorous as this, but I still think I'm very handsome and cute. All right, hey Will. Are you coming to group today? Okay, no problem. He's been here for a little over a year and has already made a huge impact. Hello everybody, welcome, welcome to Song Request or Jukebox. Usually it's on Fridays, but today's a Thursday, so a special day. Great, all right. So who wants to go first? Michael. Now interesting, because I like your last song, Sexy Eyes, really groovy. That was last week. So what is the song for today? All right, let's look it up. Well, he has great compassion and energy and commitment. So he's really been an asset. The clients really respond well. They appreciate his varied interests. They participate in the activities and um, he delivers wonderful service for our clients. The reason why I decided to work for Jespy is because I was looking for nonprofit organizations that were established, but also doing positive change and taking action within their communities and actually you know helping out people i wanted to be productive i wanted to be helpful i wanted to create positive change and do something that was impactful so normally i show up to work with my nails on under this week i have long curly hair so in regards to my gender presentation amongst some clients they perceive me as the woman so sometimes i have to correct them and say you know no i'm not a woman i'm a man and this is how I present myself. Just because I have nails, it doesn't make me any less of a man. I'm just a man with nails, a man with curly hair that's long and luxurious. I'm helping them understand that to be a man and with regards to gender, it's not so binary. Drag has not only given me confidence out of drag, but also the ability to demand and ask for respect. I respect you, I'm not treating you any differently, so you shouldn't treat me any differently. But drag, I'm assertive, I'm confident. Hello, I am your client engagement counselor or coordinator, and I'm here to help you. So if I'm confident, they can trust and rely on me. I mean, I don't want to trust nobody who's like not confident in what they're doing. Five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> yes. Being a black queer person, my existence is a protest. My existence is political. We live in a society where it's where people will tell you because you're black, you're not worthy or valuable. And because you're queer, you're also not worthy. You're also not valuable. So with me existing and living my truth and being my utmost, most confident and best person I can be, that's inspiring to everyone, inspiring to my clients. Because again, the world is not as accommodating to those with a disability. And if you go into life with the confidence and understanding that your disability does not hold you back, it might have some barriers, but you can thrive and, and be a wonderful and important member of society. And it gets to the point where if you worry about what people think about you, you're living a life for others. And to the point where that's not, it's just so toxic. Like before, when I was younger and closeted, you had to watch everything you do just so, you know, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you hold things so no one guesses that you're gay. That's exhausting. All right. Next one. Ooh, the rose. The rose. You got, no, you got it. You're doing well. Fabulous. Yep, you got it. Who got bingo? David got bingo. He just walked in. All right, I'm gonna go over to you, David, to see if you got bingo, all right? I think a lot of people like to use the word tolerance or 
I, I don't like that word because I don't want you to tolerate me. Tolerating is putting up with me. Tolerating is, you know, allowing me to exist. I don't need to do it, allow me to do anything. I'm going to do it regardless. But respect is what I demand because you don't have to like me. You don't have to like what I do or who I am, but you have to respect me because respect at the end of the day is, you know, understanding that you are human and, you know, I may not understand or agree with what you do or how you live, but at the end of the day, I will not stop you from living your life. I will not stop you from getting a job. I will not stop you from selective housing. I will not stop you from medical access because I respect you as a human being. If someone who is watching right now and they feel like they cannot be their true selves or express themselves that they want to be, it's, it's going to be a journey. It's not going to happen overnight. So you have to be strong and love yourself inside to know that whatever anyone says, it won't shake you because you are confident and you accept and you love what you are inside. When you're confident, you, you draw people near you and people love that. I'm Titus Burgess. My heart swells with pride this year because every person represented by the letters and symbols LGBTQIA plus seems to be thriving across all mediums. And we're only growing. And while we have a lot to do and a lot more people to protect, a lot more people and platforms to make aware of our presence, how much we have grown in the last year alone, worthy of a moment to pause. Thank you, thank you, and happy pride. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Somebody said to me, check out TikTok. I'm like, I am 44 years old. I am not going to roll up on TikTok to mess with these kids. All right. So what was everybody's favorite and least favorite part of the day? Meet Jose Rolone, a Brooklyn-based wedding planner and single dad of three who goes by the username NYC Gay Dad in viral videos on TikTok and Instagram. You're making me clean again? Uh. Don't make me destroy you. Parenting three kids during the pandemic gave him the creative spark that pushed him to the platform. LGBTQ rights have been going on for quite some time. But I do think in the parenting space, we really sort of still are at the forefront of that. This was a platform to be able to highlight LGBTQ plus family here that is doing the same things that you do. Was there a conscious decision to, to try and use it to break down barriers and, and shatter myths and preconceived ideas about what fatherhood is? You know, I grew up with a father who was all about like machismo and you know, you couldn't talk about your feelings. And so I think one of the things that I wanted to highlight too on social media is as a man, you can be vulnerable. Growing up, Jose always dreamed of one day becoming the kind of dad that he wished he'd had. You had this killer smile, beautiful eyes. After marrying his husband, Tim Merrill in 2010, it seemed like he was one step closer to making that dream a reality. When and how did you decide that uh, you were ready to be parents? When Tim and I met, I think he revealed to me on the third date that he did not want to have children. And I was like, oh man, 
we're in trouble here, right? Because I knew that I always wanted to have kids. But something happened right after we got married and we were outside of a coffee shop and he said to me, so I want you to know that I've been open to being open to having children. I lost it. Through surrogacy, the pair welcomed their son Avery into the world in March of 2013. Tim ended up being this really incredible father. So when we hit two months, he was walking out of the room and was holding Avery in his arms. And he's like, babe, I think we should have more children. I was like, what? And we went for it. The unexpected happened. Their surrogate became pregnant with twins. But 11 weeks into the pregnancy, while his husband Tim was on a trip in Pennsylvania, Jose got a phone call that would change everything. And I got a call uh, from the Pennsylvania uh, Police Department. I get on the phone and uh, the detective told me that he had passed away uh, the night before. Uh, and it was a heart attack uh, in his sleep. There was so much running through my head, just not only having in that moment dealing with the grieving and feeling numb, but my mind also went to, we're 11 weeks pregnant. My son just lost his father. What if something were to happen to me? I didn't want to leave him alone in this world. So I made a decision in that moment to not only follow through the pregnancy, uh, but I actually announced that we were pregnant while giving my husband's eulogy at a church in front of three, 400 people. Here we are, seven years later. Now my son is eight, my girls will be seven next week. I mean, do you ever take a step back and you look at your life and you think, sweet God, what am I doing? Three children, single dad. Yeah, look, this ride has been wild. And I think we all go through phases of grieving. Nothing is permanent. I'm aware that this can shift like that. So for me, it's really vital that I stay in this moment and I appreciate it and I'm grateful. And I keep moving forward with my kids in the best way that I can so that when those moments come where stuff goes down, hopefully I'll be ready.